Well, welcome to this episode of the Present Day Saint. I appreciate you for listening and for joining us. I am joined today uh, by Aaron Shafawalaf. Thanks again for joining us, Aaron. You bet. Glad to be here. Yeah, we are. Uh, so if you if you listen to uh, the previous two episodes uh, that Aaron has been on, Aaron was in a debate with a uh, Latter Day Saint uh, named Kwaku L. Uh, this was what now almost a month ago. Aaron is an evangelical Christian. Uh, Protestant. And and so uh, we've just been walking through, um, the, the debate was div- divided up into three parts. And so in the first episode, we looked at part one. Last episode, we looked at part two. And so today, we are going to look at part three of the debate, and then we'll get into a little bit of the Q&A that happened at the end. Um, anything on the front end, Aaron? Uh, this The third section, the question was, are families forever? And so maybe we'll talk about that for a second, but just anything on the front end that... Uh, from this uh, part of the debate that uh, sort of struck you or anything that uh, you, you know, sort of take home from this section? No, but I really enjoyed it. I just enjoyed glorying in the sufficiency of Jesus to give us community in the resurrection that doesn't depend on marriage. Yeah, I, um, I, I think if you anybody watched, uh, so uh, uh, hopefully uh, this the debrief will be much more uh, beneficial to you if you actually watch the debate. But I think anybody that watched the debate could see your pastor's heart come out. Um, really, I think in this section, and then sort of in your closing statement, and just sort of just you know, just pleading with people that uh, mm-hmm. that Jesus is enough. And uh, so I think anybody that could see that could see your your heart. And I think that what, you, what you've been expressing throughout the last couple, uh, the last two episodes we've talked is just your heart for uh, the LDS people, wanting them to, to know the true Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, all right. So let's, uh, for, for people that just maybe are new to this or are, you know, um, you know, aren't as well versed uh, as you, which is pretty much every, everybody, um, what does it mean by the, what is the question, are families forever? What does that, what does that mean? And maybe what is it, you know, how does the LDS interpretation of that uh, come into this uh, question? So at the front of it, it means, so if, if we said families are forever in the Mormon context, that means that marriage when sealed in the temple perpetuates into the afterlife and that the nuclear family with some overlapping generations persists in the afterlife. So there's this promise of having unity and connection and relationship. And there's this threat of, of the terror of going to a heavenly kingdom and yet being separated from your, uh, spouse or your children or your, your parents. So uh, Mormonism puts at the front and center of its sales pitch, as it were, that if you join their church, they can give you a means by which you can be with your family forever through the sealing relationships, the connections that are made in the temple. Uh, well, that's the front and center part of it. The bigger context for it is that God himself is in a nuclear family, that he has at least one wife uh, that he has spirit children that he's begotten. Um, he has uh, parents. So Joseph Smith taught a sermon called the Sermon in the Grove or Sermon on the Plurality of the Gods. But you can find it on Google, Sermon in the Grove. And in it, he's, he picks up on uh, an awkward King James phraseology and fr- phrasing in Revelation 1-6, where it says God and his father and... Uh, he builds a theology on that, that heavenly father has a heavenly father. And that's where you get Mormonism's uh, infinite ancestry of the gods, or at least in suggestive form in the, uh, in a, and there's a hymn, I think it's called, If You Could Hide to Kolob in the Mormon hymn book, uh, where it says uh, that essentially, we don't know when the gods began to be. So there's this sense that we, there's this unending ancestral line of family deities. So in Mormonism, uh, families are forever, but families are everything. Uh, Our God is literally a family deity and he's a cosmic patriarch over his segment of the universe. And so our goal in life is to become a cosmic patriarch deity with our own wives who beget our own kids. And so families being forever um, ends up, you know, kind of being a part of the kingdom building process. So, but, but they don't believe that's true for everybody, right? So that's only true for those who have obtained exaltation and are married. Is that correct? Yes. 
So this, and this is sort of just me asking out of ignorance, what if you have, so what if you have a single person? So for instance, like Kwaku in this debate, he's single. What if you have a single person that uh, does everything they're supposed to do, but they're, they're never married? Are they then sealed with like their parents forever, but they don't get their own? Um, you know, how does, how does, or how does that work? Uh, the short answer is that they have loopholes that they fix with the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom. So uh, they, they'll, they'll say things like, now is the time, this is the life to be sealed forever to a spouse. But then they end up incorporating uh, the thousand year premillennial, you know, sort of view into this life. And they say, well, if you weren't able, but you wanted to, if you had a, if you made a good faith effort at getting married now, but weren't able to, for some reason, uh, you'll have an opportunity uh, after the first resurrection. We'll, we can talk about that more a little, little bit, but we, that came up in the debate. Yeah, that came up in the debate. Yeah. But so for someone, and the, yeah, that's what, so for someone who, for like, let's just say Kwaku as an example, like who's single, if they don't get married in this life, they're still in their view, they're still sort of a, a second chance. And, and presumably at that point, everyone gets married who at least who's on their way to, to exaltation. Essentially. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, um, all right, well, let's, uh, kind of walk again, just like as we've been in the, done one in the past, walk through, uh, the debate. And so, uh, Kwaku was, uh, had the opening. He had the affirmative in this, uh, in this, uh, section arguing that families are forever. And, um, you know, he had sort of a couple main points uh, that we could, that we could look at. Um, first, he tried to um, he tried to root the eternality of marriage in Jewish belief, and so essentially he was trying to say that the Jewish teaching was that uh, marriage and families were forever. And he tried, he, he quoted from uh, Malachi 2, I believe it was, um, and tried to say that the Old Testament view of marriage was this covenantal view of marriage and that essentially um, trying to, I guess, make the point that God was not going to disavow those covenants uh, simply because, some, because, because of death. Uh, thoughts on at least the, the, those first two points? Yeah. Is this the passage where there's a prophecy about someone coming to re to turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers? From Malachi 2? Yeah, I don't, I don't, he read it and I wasn't even certain what he was, what the point he was trying to make uh, with that. I know he brought that up in uh, a part of the debate, but you know, just because marriage is a covenant doesn't mean it doesn't have its fulfilled, its fulfillment in something else. Um, and I think, I think probably the most powerful argument from the Latter-day Saint perspective that marriage ought to continue into the afterlife is that it was a part of a pre-fall Edenic, you know, uh, pristine creation reality. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a post-fall institution. And therefore, if the resurrection, the new heaven and the new earth are supposed to restore all the good things that were lost, then it would restore a a view of permanence. And, um, you know, there's this idea, well, if things had gone a certain way in Eden, uh, in the garden, then there wouldn't have been any death and therefore their marriage would have been, uh, perpetual. Uh, so therefore marriage should be restored in the resurrection as a perpetual institution. Um, and, and, and it's covenantal and co a covenant, you know, has its, uh, this permanent essence to it. So I think there's a couple of problems with that. One is that scripture straightforwardly teaches, for example, in Romans seven, that a married woman quote verse two, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So there's something about marriage. That's a, it's a one flesh union where death really does, uh, uh, absolve the bond. It's it, it, when your body dies, your, your, the covenants that were, uh, bodily, uh, are absolved with it. Uh, but more importantly, more importantly, we have lots of reasons to believe that what was going on in Eden, uh, wasn't altogether meant to be permanent. Uh, one clue is that the serpent is there and that's not a permanent fixture, uh, of the resurrection. Uh, and this is kind of a strange argument for Mormons to make because uh, the e the Edenic pre-fall reality is set up to be temporary, but even by their own standards, it's set up to be this deficient reality 
where they need to eat of the forbidden fruit to participate in this, this, you know, fall forward, fall upward, you know, blessed transgression. They teach that the fall is a good thing and that Adam was being imitable and wise and moral and ethical by uh, transgressing the law for the greater purpose of, of uh, entering into a state where he could have mortal children. Um, so that's kind of a rabbit hole. People could go down a, a, a different topic for a different day, but, uh, the, but there, there seems to be built within the text in Genesis uh, an expectation that something bad could happen. And um, when, um, when the New Testament uh, looks back to the Genesis text on marriage, the New Testament sees uh, the institution of marriage within Eden as having reference to something bigger and better than itself. So Paul says in Ephesians 5, quoting Genesis, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, uh, next verse. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Uh, and he uses that as a basis for ethics, for how men should treat their wives. Uh, as Christ loves the church. So marriage pointed to a greater marriage, an earthly marriage pointed to Christ's relationship with the church. And there's a, it, it, not every, not all institute, not, not all creation institutions um, are uh, just because something's good. Doesn't mean that God doesn't have something better in store for us. So yeah. yeah, he made he because he seemed to make in the sort of the second part of his opening statement, um, he seemed to make a, a sort of a, a big deal about a, sort of just about that. You know, basically, he was trying to make the case of what would heaven, um, you know, without eternal marriage look like. And, um, you know, he was you know, making trying to make the point that it's marriage is a good thing. So why would God um, why, why wouldn't, why wouldn't God just let us stay married? I mean, if it's a good thing, why would he just sort of arbitrarily cut it, cut it off, especially if it's, uh, this covenant that men and women have entered into. But so I think, A, I'd like you to address that. And then, and then B, I think I would be interesting to know just what do you think marriage is? Uh, you know, he gave his definition of marriage, um, as, um, marriage, this is what he said, was marriage is a binding of two people who uh, in love uh, to support one another, raise kids, and point people towards God. Um, do you have a different view of marriage, or do you think that's a pretty accurate uh, definition? Oh, I think about that a little bit. So one, I, mean, I would say marriage is a one flesh union with an oath built into its very nature, uh, it, with a public commitment, uh, with, a, with an inherent purpose toward multiplying the image of God on earth. So it, it, in Genesis 1 and 2, um, it's connected with this mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to image God, to represent God over the rest of the earth. So we are meant to fill the earth with the glory of God and to represent him with many image-bearing people. And we do that through... Uh, procreation. We also do that with gendered complementarity. So there's something beautiful about men and women that's distinctly beautiful. Uh, it's not, uh, one's not better than the other, but they're different from one another. And so marriage is meant to be in the context of multiplying the image of God on earth, uh, a, a way to highlight the beautiful uh, complementary differences between men and women. Uh, um, there's no reason to think that, uh, the beauty of gendered complementarity depends finally on marriage for the showcasing of those beautiful differences. So in the resurrection, we have every reason to think that we will perpetually be men and women, uh, but we don't have any reason to think that uh, showcasing the different beauty and the different, uh, you know, the different things those highlight, those genders highlight is dependent on the context of marriage. In fact, we have uh, already preview examples here on earth of how men and women can shine in their gendered beauty, uh, their gendered purposes, uh, irrespective of marriage and, and people who are in single celibate, uh, life's, you know, a, a path of life. 
Um, I'm not sure if I answered your, your whole question. The, the idea that there's a, there was a kind of sense that the word covenant is, is kind of a, uh, a word that you could just kind of wave, you know, it's kind of like, like a, a like a joker card or I don't know, like a, a wild card where if, if you just say the word, then therefore it's meant to be permanent. Uh, and I don't think that works in scripture. I don't think it, with respect to marriage, especially, um, you really have to make more of a specific case for that you know, situating it with a, a, mer- a covenant at minimum in scripture seems like a promise that has um, an oath attached to it. And uh, there's a series of covenants that God gives in scripture, um, but they have f- their fulfillment uh, in Christ. So uh, I'm not, I, I'm not quite seeing the point here that marriage has to be eternal that marriage between men and women, the one flesh union has to be eternal, especially when scripture gives us, uh, a, you know, evidence to the contrary. And it, especially when it points to something bigger and better than itself. It seems like the, the way that the only way I could, I was thinking about this is if I, if we do believe that marriage is like you said, for, um, uh, you know, propagating the species for, um, to, to fill the earth. Um, if, if that is like sort of an, essential nature to marriage and they do believe that they're going to continue to have, you know, spirit babies and have their own, you know, other planets, you know, in the future, then it seems like, okay, then, then I could see where they would, where they would say that that had to continue. But obviously then that gets into the exact question, which we'll talk about here, you know, especially as you go through your opening statement of of why you don't believe that that's the case. But, um, but yeah, I guess it seems like if, if they are going to continue to have children, obviously then, um, then it seems like marriage would continue, but that's what, what you're going to argue. Uh, yeah, which we'll get to in a second. That, that's not what scripture talks about. Kingdom building is a really important concept here, relevant to marriage. Uh, in the New Testament, the idea is that Christ will subject all things under his feet and he will have filled all. He will be in all and fill all and be over all. And so the, uh, the new creation mandate um, sounds like the original creation mandate. Jesus says, be fru- uh, sorry, <laughs> Jesus says, make disciples of all the nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded. So there's this teaching in the New Testament that Jesus is king. He has brought the kingdom. And the purpose of the Christian life is um, to put everything under the feet of Jesus. Uh, and and the, the, the pinnacle of all this is Jesus... Uh, his kingdom coming and his will be done. And the, the celebration at the end with the great wedding feast, you know, the great, uh, the, the finale is the celebration that everything has been conquered by Jesus. And so there's something about the climax of the second coming of Jesus that brings that original and then new creation mandate to a fulfillment such that procreation doesn't seem to be required anymore there's also language in scripture about the kingdom uh, being uh, finalized in a sense when the full number of the elect has, has been brought in the scattered people of God have been gathered. So uh, it's and one more point here is that this is very, in the new Testament, it's very focused on Christ. Whereas in Mormonism, the idea about the idea of having, a spouse or multiple spouses, which is, that's not just a smear. That's a very real thing in current Mormonism where in the temple, if your wife has died, you can be spoused, you can be sealed to a second and third and fourth spouse in the temple. And then there's the, there's a, an expectation of being a polygamous exalted God someday with multiple wives, begetting spirit babies and populating your own planets. In Mormonism though, this takes a different turn where you are building your own kingdom. So this is the the core difference here is that you're becoming a a regional cosmic divine patriarch over your own generation of the family tree of the gods. And uh, you're building your kingdom. Well, if, if this is all about Jesus, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Yeah, totally. Um, And, and like, uh, Russell Nelson is on his, I mean, he, his wife, his first wife died, right? And now he's, he's remarried. They're both so. sealed in temple. So he's, I mean, he's, he will be a polygamist on, on their view. He would be a polygamist in exaltation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it seems like, so, so two more things from Quaker's opening statement. One was, he, he kept making this point and, and you, you, you 
I mean, I think you, you, you addressed it during the cross-examination, but his idea of it's not good for man to be alone, I think is, is just interesting uh, to say the least, is it seems like he's, he takes that to say, therefore, that's why we are to stay married, I guess, now. Um, but as you pointed out, when the command, you know, when, when God said that's because Adam was the literally only person on earth. And so a woman was created, you know, to be his help me to be, you know, the complementarian view, like you, you talked about. Um, I don't know, that just seemed like an interesting view. And then he, tra- he tried to kind of uh, move that along through the New Testament. But it seems that the point of that text seems to be that uh, when it was just Adam, it wasn't good for him, him to be alone. That's why Eve was created. Yeah, and I do think that when Adam is naming the creatures, this is the context, he's probably noticing the gendered complementarity in um, creation that over which he's... So I think the naming mandate that Adam has over the rest of creation is more than just a superficial labeling project. It's a project of understanding. It's a project of dominion. It's a project of... of uh, being a good steward. And so when Adam sees the gendered complementarity that's built into the rest of creation, it's, it's probably both about his loneliness that God is giving him uh, a wife for, but it's also about how uh, Adam isn't adequate to display the gendered complementarity of the human race, uh, nor is he adequate to, um, you know, uh, be a steward over the rest of creation without, uh, without, uh, we'll say friend at minimum. And then really a wife that uh, helps him complete the gender spectrum. As it were, we, we don't have any reason to think that in the new creation, the new resur- the, re- the resurrection life, that there will be an absence of gendered complementarity or an absence of community. Uh, that uh, I think Latter-day Saints have a historical tradition of stereotyping the Protestant view of the resurrection as a very isolated, lonely, uh, zero community, zero intimate friendships. So this is why I want to I want to say really clearly that my relationships and my community in the resurrection um, they won't just be okay; they will be better than marriage. More, my, I'll be closer to my wife in the resurrection uh, than I was here, and I won't need marriage for that. And resurrection paves the way for, uh, that opportunity. Yeah, that was, that was going to be, that was the last question I was going to, ha- I was in, in this section, because it does seem like, you know, he, it seems like he was basically, because one of his questions, what are we going to be doing in heaven? If it seems like if we're not having sex, it seems like it, it, on his view, if we're not procreating, if we don't have, you know, that we're going to just be kind of sitting around doing nothing. And he said, uh, at one point, it, um, I, you know, he said something along the lines of, um, Protestants, uh, don't, uh, you know, God, he said, he used, he said this quote, God, God, God's love is the only love that we need. He said this, you know, I hear this from Protestants and he said, well, that's a good Pinterest quote, but it doesn't mean anything. And, uh, you know, this is paraphrased, but he says, basically evangelicals know nothing of what heaven will be like. Um, and so on his view, it seems like it was that just sort of that view of just isolationism. So what, what do you, what do you think um, the new heavens, the new earth, what do you think um, it's going to be like? What are, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh boy. So there's this book, there's this book by Randy Alcorn uh, called heaven and it's thick. It's, it's not a light read and he surveys the biblical evidence for heaven. And I'm just going off of the top of my head here, but um, we have every reason to think there will be property and government and organization and um, stewardship and creation and projects and work and relationships and joy and learning. And I would say eternal progression. I have no reason to think I, I, I have I have some solid reasons to think in the New Testament that the immeasurable kindness that Christ will show me um, will take in eternity for me to grow in my, my inheritance in Christ isn't something that I can instantly receive. Um, and then just simply appreciate, I have to appropriate that inheritance forever. And therefore I have to grow eternally in my capacities and my knowledge and my enjoyment and my power and my holiness forever, uh, to enjoy, uh, the depth of who God is and the, and, and the depth of what he has for me. So I, I don't have, I mean, 
No, I has seen. No, hear, ear has heard. I, there is poetic language because it is far beyond us. But we do have a lot of touch points in scripture, um, such that we do have a lot of categories of continuity into the resurrection. Uh, you know, perhaps there's even hierarchy of people who are in charge of other people. Um, culture, a, 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 perhaps ethnicities and different languages and personalities, and uh, it's not boring. Um, I do get. Uh, it is, it, I don't think, um, uh, Mormons say things like it, you're just going to be worshiping God forever. That, that sounds really boring. That doesn't resonate with my Christian in, uh, instincts. Uh, worship is, is very not boring. <laughs> it, it, I, I have a very different experience of worship, so I'm happy to do that forever, but uh, the, the way that God meant for Adam to enjoy a relationship with God in the Garden of Eden was in the context of community and relationship and stewardship of a creation. <clears throat> and I have every reason to think that uh, there will be a basic continuity of relationship and community and things like that in the resurrection. I don't think, though, uh, so and this is important because a lot of Latter-day Saints are also given the stereotype that the Christian heaven is disembodied. So I like to, I don't like to make a singular reference to heaven very often. I like to say heaven and the resurrection, heaven and the resurrection. There will be a resurrection of my body. Um, I will have, you know, I, I will, I will look similar, but I will be, I, I will be very different. Um, it's kind of like a seed. Paul makes this, that's the whole point of Paul's analogy in first Corinthians 15. Uh, not that there's a separation of kingdoms, but that there is a principle of seed to, to fruition that you, you put a seed in the ground and then it comes, it has its own, uh, it, it remains the same basic thing, but it's very different after it comes to fruition. Um, so a resurrection body will, I will have a resurrection body and it will still be my body, but it'll be as, uh, it'll be very different. Yeah, I think that, uh, I love that book by Alcorn. I think I read it, I don't know how many years ago, but that's Influence, it influenced so much the way I just sort of it's changing in my view on heaven. And I think you're right. I think so many LDS, but I think so many, even Christians just have that, like, like Alcorn says in the book, this platonic view of heaven, that's going to be just disembodied spirits floating around. And, and, um, you know, I think that's just so, I mean, if you think about heaven, it's going to be, or the new heavens, and new earth as you know, Alcorn I think calls about and talks about in the book, or like you said, the, the resurrection in heaven, uh, where every day will be, will be greater than the day in the past that there, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing about it that would be boring, uh, ever. So I think the it's best important. is always to come in Christ. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Which is, oh, which is amazing. Um, okay. So, uh, all right, so, that, so that's Quaku's essentially uh, his opening statement. There's a couple other things that, that he said that I want to get to, but we'll do that in the, that came up in the cross-examination. Um, okay, so your opening statement um, as to why you would say uh, families in the sense of you know, the nuclear family that we experience today, uh, husbands, wives, uh, kids, are not going to be forever. So um, I firstly base this off of straightforward statements about Jesus that point us in the right direction. He says, Jesus, that uh, whoever does the will of his father in heaven is his mother, uh, is, his, is his brother or sister. So we get this sense from Jesus that even when his mom and his brothers show up, you know, in a crowded house and they're like, hey, go sin for Jesus. This is crazy. What is he doing? And, and, and Jesus is told, hey, your, your mom and your siblings are looking for you. Jesus says, whoever does the will of my father is my my sibling or my mother, um, that, that should clue us in that Jesus has a reoriented view of the family. It's not a perpetuated, it's not a merely perpetuated nuclear family. It's, it's centered around something different. Uh, blood relations uh, are not the basis of this new family. It's a unity in Christ. Uh, it's a unity of doing the will of the father. So that's, that's one thing. The other, th the other thing is Jesus says, um, well, Jesus anticipates that following him, being a disciple of Jesus, will require, in many ways, giving up your nuclear family. He anticipates uh, a sword, even, he says. He came to bring a sword. Uh, he, he anticipates having to leave homes and family for his sake. And it's not hard to imagine how that plays out. We've seen it where people are estranged from their family when they become a disciple of Jesus. That happens in Utah with Mormons. People are um, go through, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thick part of Mormon culture that if your spouse 
becomes uh, a non-Mormon, then you have this sort of culturally justifiable basis to divorce them. So there's a there's a there's a trail of pain and tears in Mormon history of spouses who have a half dozen or dozen kids leaving their spouse because of the you know this sometimes pressure um, or this felt sense of freedom that I can just leave my spouse now that they no longer believe in the LDS Church that goes against the ethic of Jesus by the way about marriage and divorce, but. Um, so there's been a lot of ex-Mormon Christians in Utah, though, who, who have not voluntarily left their spouse, but they, they have been divorced or they have been, you know, or at least they've stayed married and they've stayed faithful and they stayed loving, but there's a kind of deep felt sense of loss of a greater relationship they wish they could have had it or, you know, estrangement from your family. Well, Jesus says those who leave him, uh, sorry, leave, those who leave a uh, family for the sake of him will have a hundredfold uh, in this life and the next, mothers and brothers and sisters and lands. Uh, so Jesus, that that to me should uh, give us a, a neat clue there. Jesus anticipates that we will have a hundredfold mothers in this life and the next, in, his, in this new kingdom community family. And so I, that doesn't fit. I mean, I, unless you're just kind of being weird with polygamy where, oh yeah, maybe my, <laughs> but, th- but that, I don't think that's Jesus's point. There's a hundredfold mothers, even in this life. Uh, and, and I think Christians know where Jesus is going with that. My, my kids say, oh, Jesus is telling us a riddle. What does this mean? Like, yeah, that's right. He's, he's being a wisdom teacher here. He's teaching us that there's a different kind of family that we have. It's even better. It's bigger. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. You just said, you said that you would, uh, you said you will enjoy your wife more in heaven uh, without marriage uh, and sex, obviously, than you do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what, maybe expand on that for a bit. Um, oh, I have every reason to think that my relationship with my wife, though not exclusive and centered around our one flesh union or that of pr- sex and procreation, will have a greater joy. And this, it'll be, there'll be no sin. I will have a clarity of mind on human beauty and on Christ's beauty. Um, I will have, uh, I, I will more deeply know my wife, Stacy in the resurrection, even though she won't be my wife then. Um, I will have a greater joy in unity with her over the things that most matter. And, and then simply here, I just have to play, I have to play the mystery card. There's just stuff in heaven and the resurrection I don't know about yet um, that is better than creational realities here. Um, I, I think sex is really powerful because it, um, for one, it's you know obviously an immense physical pleasure, but it's meant to be an uh, uh, an expression of a one flesh union between two embodied souls. Right? It's pretty powerful. Um, s- sex is a spiritual reality, and people who have had sex outside of marriage, have kind of felt the spiritual weight sometimes of, of just what happened. Not that that makes it ethical, but just, it's more than just, it's more than just two mechanical bodies doing something. It's, it, it, well, it points to, um, it, uh, Paul, uh, sees marriage and the one flesh union of marriage as pointing to something, it being referential, to Christ's relationship with the church. And there's unity language in the New Testament of Christ's relationship with the church. Uh, there's, there's, uh, yeah, we have reasons to think that there's a kind of joy and pleasure in relationship that um, is even better than that. So yeah, well, it, it helps it helps to at least establish with Latter-day Saints that I'm going to know my wife. She's going to know my name. I'm going to know her name. We're gonna have a relationship still. Um, it's not that we become strangers. Uh, but you know, I hope that helps a little bit with Latter-day Saints because they're, they're given, given this sort of stereotype that we're just going to be, you know, disembodied people with, that are isolated, you know, strumming a harp and then doing this thing that they think is boring, which is what they worship. But um, it, it is a fuller picture that scripture gives us. But you, uh, you, you quoted uh, Jeffrey Holland when he said, he said, it wouldn't be heaven without my wife. Um, yeah, that's, that is an interesting view. And basically they're saying that if, apart from that relationship, 
uh, it wouldn't be heaven. So, um, you know, versus our view, which is apart from Christ, it wouldn't be heaven. Uh, and then you actually tell the, that you tell that funny story about your wife, who basically, you know, about you. I don't know, maybe share that with, share, I'm sure people, hopefully people, have, again, watch the debate, but if they haven't, share that story. Oh, it's a delightful story. It's my favorite part of the debate um, because I, okay, so uh, there was this BYU professor um, who came to the living room uh, of the host. We were in a basement apartment. And he, at one point, looks at my wife and he says, don't you want to be married to your husband forever? And she said, no, I won't need to be. I'll be with Christ. And uh, my, it, what sweetened the moment in the debate was I, I saw Stacy in the crowd, so I pointed at her. And uh, there's like 300 people, 150 on each side, just whoosh. And it's like 300 heads turned and looked at my wife. And she's sitting there smiling. <laughs> it's just, but, uh, you know, it, when she said that to the professor, no. I wasn't feeling let down. I wasn't feeling uh, disappointed or insulted by that at all. It was, it was, it was, in fact, in the moment, it was a, a cause for increased romantic feelings. It was, um, it, and honestly, sisterly, brotherly affection for her. Just, just, uh, just sweet love, Christian love. Like, oh, my wife, my wife and I are on the same page here. Uh, Christ for her is her greatest pleasure. Apart from him, she has no good thing. Um, and uh, to be in his presence, it, there's fullness and of pleasure and joy. That's heaven. That's why it's so weird for Christians to hear about this talk in Latter-day Saint theology of a ter telestial and terrestrial kingdom where Christ does not dwell. So Kwaku really equivocated, uh, hedged on this, but I, I, I tried to you know, I think in the first part too, talk about how, um, isn't it so in Latter-day Saint theology that Jesus doesn't visit the telestial kingdom and he only visits the terrestrial and he, you know, he abides or dwells in a special way in the celestial. And he, he would not give a straight answer on that. Uh, he knew exactly where I was going with that and he did not want to answer that straightforwardly. But um, for Christians, so there's this folk Latter-day Saint repeated teaching. Uh, you, you hear it from Latter-day Saint missionaries all the time. And it's, and they borrow it. They borrow the language from a, a Joseph Smith quote. I don't think it's necessarily what he meant, but it's a, it's a thick part of Mormon culture that the bottom two heavenly kingdoms of heaven, the telestial and terrestrial kingdoms are so glorious that if you knew what they were like, if you caught a glimpse of what they were like, you would want to commit suicide just to get there. And they speak of them out of both sides of their mouth, they'll say, you know, it's so wonderful. It's so joyful. Um, you'd want to commit suicide just to get there, but you better qualify for celestial exaltation. You better be temple worthy. You better live a righteous and worthy and covenant keeping life. Because if you don't, you're going to be separated from your family forever uh, in one of the bottom kingdoms. And this is where the, the contradiction comes out. They say, and it'll be a life perpetually full of eternal torment of mind with eternal regret. It'll be as a, an eternal punishment. It'll be as a hell for you because you will wish for the rest of eternity that you were in a higher kingdom. So they talk, uh, you know, dichotomously uh, contradictory about the bottom two kingdoms. But um, where was, was I going with this? It's very strange though, for Christians to hear Latter-day Saints talk in any positive way about the bottom two kingdoms, because the whole point in the, in the Bible of heaven is being with, with Christ. That's the point. So for them to talk about smiles and, you know, just joy with that, that's weird for us. It's being with Christ. Um, yeah. So, you know, Jesus doesn't seem to, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about Paul, Paul in first Corinthians seven, Typically, the way an evangelical would quote 1 Corinthians 7 on this issue is just to go straight to the verses where Paul says, it's better not to get married. And that's that's legitimate. Uh, Paul says uh, he wishes that we would be as he is with, a, with, with the ability to have a more single-minded, uh, singular focus on Christ, um, not being distracted by all the legitimate worries and anxieties of marriage. Um and so that's, that's, that's a great verse to go to. And it doesn't fit the Latter-day Saint worldview at all. 
And so a lot of Latter-day Saints argue that Paul's just giving bad advice, that he's just giving his opinion, um, that he's just... Uh, yeah, that's what Quaku argued. I mean, he said Paul was wrong a lot of times and kind of hedged. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. No, yeah. So during, so, during the cross-examination where this, where this came up, where you asked him that, and that was where that's what he sort of, he just kind of threw Paul under the bus. As oh, you said. I straightforwardly asked him, what do you do with 1 Corinthians 7 when Paul teaches that even if you are married you should live as though you're not. And the, the idea isn't to treat your spouse like you're a jerk or to, you know, abdicate your responsibilities as a husband. The idea is to live in anticipation and with a clear mind toward the resurrection reality of no longer being married, that this is a temporary thing, this, this marriage, uh, this marital life. Well, Paul, instead of, I'm sorry, Kwaku, instead of, you know, twisting the text, he just says, you know, sometimes Paul is wrong. Uh, sometimes Paul's, you know, Paul, Paul also taught some other crazy things. Kwaku essentially said that he doesn't agree with. So it's easy for Kwaku to throw his apostles under the bus, not just his living apostles, but his, uh, the apostle, the apostolic teaching, uh, he made reference to things like, uh, Jonah, where Jonah sins. I think you might've said Peter, where Peter sins, um, as examples, I think at least Jonah, as, as examples of prophetic failure in scripture. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about where scripture shines a light and exposes the sins of God's own chosen servants. I'm talking about the straightforward teachings of God's chosen servants, where they publicly and straightforwardly give uh, instruction on doctrine and gospel and ethics. Well, Kwaku feels so uh, not bound, not humbly uh, obligated to submit himself under the apostolic teaching of Paul, even when it's canonized into scripture, that he was willing to just completely dismiss what Paul has taught on that. Um, but that, that should really be a, like a, if, if a Mormon's listening to this, that should really be some, a heavy, uh, you know, 30 pound kettleball that you have to put on, on your shelf. Uh, this, this does not fit with Mormonism. Um, Paul's teaching that we should live as though, even though we're married, we should live as though we're not going to be married in the resurrection. Um, Jesus teaches something similar to this. He says that um, uh, when he's asked about divorce and remarriage, Jesus gives a really strict ethic. And so Jesus does a throwback to um, the Genesis text, you know, the two shall become one flesh. And Jesus extrapolates, let no man separate what God has joined together. Uh, it was God himself that uh, separated Eve, uh, as it were, you know, out of Adam, that took a rib and created Eve from the rib and then joined Eve, Eve to Adam. So God is in the business of doing that kind of thing. When a marriage, this is why Christians don't recognize same-sex marriage. It's a very spiritual act. Even when it's officiated by a government official like a judge, it's really not the judge or a pastor that is actually the efficient officiator of the marriage. It's when we believe that when a marriage actually happens, that is legitimate. It's God himself that joins a man, man and a woman. Well, Jesus extrapolates from this that you really should not give, you should not entertain divorce, uh, except he gives an exception clause, you know, in, in, unless uh, adultery happens. Um, so the disciples are flabbergasted and they say, well, maybe we shouldn't get married. Maybe it's better not to marry. And Jesus, instead of, you know, say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. That's not the implication I meant for you to draw. Jesus essentially shrugs his shoulders and he says, you should consider the eunuchs. <laughs> the eunuchs are, some are eunuchs, you know, from birth. Some are made eunuchs by other men. Some are eunuchs by their own volition for the sake of the kingdom. So these are single celibate people who are living a completely legitimate kingdom path of, of life. Uh, marriage is, marriage absolutely is the normal course, the normal pathway. It's good for uh, young men to be taught to have a general aim toward developing a career, you know, finding a wife, raising a family with kids. But uh, there is an option though, for some people that are set aside for uh, celibacy uh, for the sake of the kingdom. That's not an illegitimate path when it's done in a concerted and purposeful and kingdom oriented way. Um, so this doesn't fit the Latter-day Saint theology of, 
of the Latter-day Saint theology says you got to get married if it's within your means. Otherwise you're going to be uh, relegated to a lower kingdom uh, or, or at least you won't be in the uh, highest sub level of the celestial kingdom exalted. Uh, and so uh, yeah, that, that's really strange. So I, those passages lead up for me and they kind of prime my audience to the New Testament, not teaching what the Latter-day Saint theology teaches about marriage. Uh, when Jesus, ta- it's really hard to find positive things that Jesus says about marriage. Jesus, he, do, he values marriage. Uh, he does say a positive thing about it, but Jesus doesn't in sen- s- sappy sentimental ways dote on marriage as a permanent reality in the New Testament. Which, which if, I mean, it's one thing for Kwaku to, to, or, you know, not pick on Kwaku. It's one thing for the LDS to throw Paul under the bus on that, but to throw Jesus under the bus on that, um, you know, I, I think he would even hesitate to do that. And it, you're, if there was ever an opportunity for him to just extol why marriage, marriage is necessary for exaltation, all these things, here was an opportunity for him to do that. And instead he does the exact opposite. So it just seems, seems, you know, it seems problematic uh, to say the least for, for that view. Um, so I, yeah, I think if, it's interesting as you're talking, I'm just thinking that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of Christian Christianized, we can say it that way. Um, evangelical teaching, it, it falls into this camp too, where we, we almost, we elevate, we, we make marriage like almost like it's, you know, an essential and we kind of delegate, you know, uh, denigrate singles. And I was even thinking in evangelical circles where we have a, this sort of false view of heaven, uh, new heavens, and new earth. And um, so just talking just why these, this, it's so important to think well about uh, these most important things. And, you know, as evangelicals, Maybe you know. I think it's important uh, for us to to know what we believe and, and why we believe it. Certainly, so that we can share these uh, important truths yeah. with people that you know that that are on fault that believe false gospels. And it's doubly relevant to the 21st century, where we have the hot topic of same-sex marriage or uh, same-sex orientation, where Jesus gives a legitimate pathway. He even esteems the legitimate pathway of a single celibate life for the sake of the kingdom. And so Christians ought to have a very clear category of, of uh, there might be a person in their church who is called to single celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of God. Um, and, and we should have a place in the social life of the church that accommodates and welcomes and uh, treats as equals those who are single and celibate for the sake of the kingdom uh, on purpose. Right. And that, we, we should, uh, and I don't want to, I'm not, I, I'm not one to beat up on fellow Christians like this or, you know, shame unduly, but, um, I, I think we can try to think about, um, incorporating into friendships and social life just as best as we can. It, even when you've got somebody who's just, they want to be married, but they can't for some, you know, they're looking for a spouse and they haven't found one yet. And it's really hard when you're in your young 20s and you, all your friends are getting married and all the social activities are... Anyway, I'm going off the pathway here, but uh, it, 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 what's really interesting about the Matthew 19 text here is that Jesus does a throwback to the Adam and Eve prototype, the one flesh union for the foundation of ethics in marriage. So Jesus here um, both reaffirms the male-female structure of the one flesh union of marriage and he esteems the single celibate pathway of the kingdom of God for certain people. And uh, Mormonism is having trouble right now with both of those. Um, it, it doesn't honor the single celibate pathway to the kingdom of God like Jesus does. And right now, there seems to be a seismic shift in the culture of Mormonism and a kind of loosening of ethical commitment to the uh, male, female structure of marriage. Um, it's no longer considered an act of apostasy to enter into a same sex marriage in Mormonism. Uh, it's considered a serious, they have these, you know, categories. It's a serious transgression, but it's not an act of apostasy. So, and, and, and more, more concretely, the culture over half of Mormon millennials support same sex marriage and they would be over the moon happy if their church accommodated this into their theology. Um, and this is in the, in the, critical ex- examination, uh, this did come up and I, I pressed Kwaku on this and he, he, 
it's interesting if you listen to the language really carefully, he said it was the Christian and the Latter-day Saint position that marriage was between a man and a woman, but he would not use the strongest language available to him to signal his own personal commitment to the ethical position. Uh, he, he, he didn't necessarily think, by his own words in that situation anyway, that God himself, he, he would not use the strong language or affirm the strong language that God himself took the position of marriage only being between a man and a woman. And we're, in Utah, this, this might sound irrelevant to people, Mormons, Mormonism is a conserv- ethically and biblically, with respect to ethics, a conservative religion. Well, it really depends who you're talking to. It depends how old they are. Um, a lot of people are Latter-day Saints, and they have one foot in, one foot out, and their more excited, enthusiastic commitment is to cultural ideas concerning ethics or political ideas. And so uh, that becomes a really important part of it. Anyway, that's just a side note, but the, 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 the sort of the big text that all of this leads up to all of these other texts are, are pointing us in a direction and they're, they're priming our ears to hear this. Jesus teaches in Matthew 22 um, that at the resurrection, they will neither marry nor be given in re- marriage, but they shall be as the angels. Uh, and the, the context for this is Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection are trying to, by the way, this is a Holy Week uh, text. And um, we know a lot about the last week of Jesus's earthly pre-resurrection life. And uh, we know a lot, we know what he did Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday in the shuffle wall of household, we call it stump the Messiah day. It's when Jesus has this, and we have my wife, yes, we read uh, two days ago, we we had a a reading, a Holy week reading on the front porch. And Stacy got out her, we got out a YouTube video where the, um, the Western showdown tune. uh, And we would, we would play the tune between every showdown, uh, between Jesus and the Herodians, Jesus and the Sadducees, and Jesus and the Pharisees, and Jesus and the teachers of the law. Well, this is a Tuesday uh, happening where Jesus, they're trying to stump the Messiah and make him look embarrassed. So the Sadducees, it's their turn, you know, on a, on this Holy Week Tuesday, and they ask Jesus, okay, let's say there's a woman and she's got seven consecutive husbands who die, and um, which one will she be married to? And Jesus, in and, and this is in, all the de- all the details matter here. In answering the question, which one will she be married to? He says, you don't know the power of God and you don't know the scriptures. At the resurrection, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They shall be like the angels. So the straightforward reading of this is that none of these marriages this woman has, uh, had, had, will perpetuate. E- either by uh, sheer perpetuation or by sort of reconstitution, uh, by like a remarriage. Um, th- she, the, the, the answer to which one will she be married to, the status, marital status, is essentially none. Uh, and that we will be more like the angels. And the angels in this context are single. They're, they're, they're understood by the Jewish, Jewish people to be single, not married. Um, so Mormon leaders have had uh, they, they have, uh, well, in Charles Harrell's book, he has a whole page on this and he goes through the different, through the different interpretations Latter-day Saint leaders have taken on this. Some, some Latter-day Saint leaders have taught that Jesus was essentially, uh, p- playing a bit of a deception game that he was telling them milk because they weren't ready for meat. He was concealing the truth. They, they wouldn't say deception, they wouldn't say lying, but um, the, the essential, the, the essence of it is Jesus is talking to people. He didn't, he didn't want to throw his pearls before swine. So he's, he's giving them, you know, a little bit that, you know, throws them off. Uh, the other Latter-day Saint construals are that perhaps Jesus is speaking of a certain kind of marriage, uh, that Jesus will, is only, sp- that that the point Jesus is making is that she wouldn't be married to any of them if not for celestial marriage, that, that uh, earthly marriage short of sealing uh, is the kind of marriage that doesn't perpetuate. And hence you need to be uh, sealed in the temple. You need to be celestially married. Um, uh, Other Latter-day Saints have taught that she will be married to the first, (laughs) 
of the husbands. Uh, oh, uh, what is it? I don't have it off the top of my head. They, 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 can, they connect some dots. I could maybe write an article about this later. Um, other Latter-day Saints say um, that, okay, so I'll, I won't go through more variations, but the essential idea in Mormonism is that, uh, well, a lot, I think the most common Latter-day Saint take on this is that Jesus is affirming that the time to get married eternally is now. In that uh, at the resurrection, there won't be any more marital events. There won't be any more acts of marriage. Uh, there won't be any more opportunities to seal maritally yourself to another. Thus, you ought to be sealed in marriage before the resurrection. So this gets funny. Well, you know, if you, if you, if you Google how Latter-day Saints deal with this verse you'll see stuff like, well, the time to get married is in this life. Well, you've, you have these loopholes in Mormonism that they have to close. So what happens if you're born a eunuch? What happens if you're uh, born of a certain situation where you would get married, but were unable to? To account for that, Latter-day Saints say that after the first resurrection, there will be an era the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ. They take a, they, they historically have taken a very premillennial view um, of eschatology. And so they, they kind of use that thousand years as a loophole closer where, you know, that's kind of like the, the safety net, the, the fallback. And so during that time, marriages that needed to be performed for eternity could be performed. And they get really funny about the details. I have to correct something I said in the debate. Um, I said, actually, in Latter-day Saint thought, um, at the resurrection, oh, how did I put it? Um, but you, he said, because this came up, this was when, uh, when Quakey was crossing you, and you basically said that there, you said that there, um, on, on their view, there wouldn't be marriage uh, after the resurrection. No, no, you said there would, and he said there wouldn't. Is that correct? So, obviously, in the biblical view, I don't think there is. Sure, sure, but on, on, even, uh, you were saying on, LD, on, their, on the LDS view. Yes, so Quaku was underrepresenting the Latter-day Saint view um, because in the Latter-day Saint view, it, as the thought is developed, if you, if you do some searches and see how Latter-day Saint leaders have kind of tried to close the loophole the, the, with the millennium, there's different Latter-day Saint thought about how marriages would be performed after the first resurrection. And the way I articulated this was based on some conversations I've had with Latter-day Saints. Um, but I, 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 I mixed up the details. It's not, so the idea, according to some Latter-day Saints, is that, well, maybe you're in the spirit world, not necessarily in spirit prison. Maybe you're in paradise. I said spirit prison, but I was wrong about that. Maybe you're in, in the paradise. Maybe you're in spirit world. And, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm mixing up the details right now. I forget. I, I, you have to forgive me. I'll mix up the details. But I, I said something to the effect of uh, there being proxy marriages uh, performed by those who have, yeah, performed by those who have resurrected bodies after the first resurrection done in proxy on behalf of those who are in spirit, the spirit world. So the idea is that certain people were worthy to be uh, a part of the first resurrection, but they haven't been sealed yet to their spouse. So they're, you know, on one end of it, after the first resurrection, somebody who's resurrected is doing it on behalf of somebody who isn't. I think I got the details flipped there. Um, so uh, we got the quote here. Um, so there's a quote by Joseph Fielding Smith in Doctrines of Salvation, volume three, chapter four, uh, where he, he argues that, um, okay, I'll, I'll read it out loud. I'm sorry. This is kind of technical, but I feel like it needs correction. How do those worthy of the first resurrection, but weren't able uh, to get married for eternity actually get married? 
So, so you died as an infant. Quakers seem to think that in Matthew 22, the remarks by Jesus only applied to the second resurrection. So the, in the premillennial eschatology of the first resurrection, the thousand year reign, and then you have the second resurrection. So he seemed to think that Jesus's remarks in Matthew 22 only applied that there's no more uh, events of marriage or acts of marriage or even proxy marriage after the second resurrection. In other words, that no weddings are allowed after final judgment, which in that eschatology is at the sec- second resurrection. That's seen as happening after, at the end of the millenni- millennium. Uh, other Mormons seem to think that the passage in Matthew also applies to the first resurrection and think that marriages are performed by proxy by non-resurrected mortals during the millennium on behalf of those unmarried who are resurrected. And that I, that's the better, uh, I, I have a quote to that effect by Joseph Fielding Smith in, in the source I just mentioned earlier. Other Mormons have told me that resurrected married beings with resurrected bodies during the millennium do a proxy wedding on behalf of those who are unmarried in the spirit world. So I mentioned view three uh, in that last one I just mentioned in the debate, but I mistakenly said spirit prison. Um, so the, the, the other view, though, uh, that the marriages are performed, weddings are performed by proxy. So in Mormonism, you can do uh, baptisms by proxy. Somebody can do it on behalf of another. Uh, that it can be performed by non-resurrected mortals during the millennium on behalf of those who are unmarried and yet who are resurrected. Okay, I'm, I'm sure I just lost everybody. <laughs> but so the, let's just bring it back to simplicity. Jesus says there's no more weddings at the resurrection. And, and Mormonism says, aha, that means that we, the time to get married is in this life. But the category of this life incorporates the time after the first resurrection, all the way up to the end of the millennium. Mm-hmm. And so it, just, it gets to be, I, I kind of just had to get in the weeds there and, 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 and iron out some details, but. But they're, gets, the, but they're saying then they're on our view, they're saying it's, it's in this life and the next, but on their view, they're saying, yeah, but it's still before this, before the second resurrection. So it still counts. Yes. It's very strange too, because marriage is a very bodily union. In fact, historic Christianity has seen the initial consummation, the sexual consummation of marriage as a really important part of, of you could say, sealing the marriage. Uh, in fact, in the Old Testament, if that didn't go well in some ways, or it never happened, um, marriage was seen as nullified. Uh, and, uh, and so and if you really wanted to have a proxy marriage, a proxy wedding, uh, biblically and naturally, you would have to have a proxy consummation and Mormons don't do that. Uh, they, they don't go that far. So yeah. So this, 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 you know, this kind of gets silly, but the straightforward teaching by Jesus is there's no more weddings. There's no more marriage at the resurrection. We're going to be like the angels. Um, and the way he frames this is you don't to the, to the Sadducees, you don't know the power of God and you don't know the scriptures. And it really looks like in context, what he's saying to the Sadducees is you, you're not, you're not exercising your imagine, excuse me, your, your imaginations enough to really wrap your head around the depth of the power of God and the uh, incredible reality that scripture points to in the resurrection. Um, your, your categories are too small. You're thinking too small. Uh, the resurrection life uh, renders those earthly categories obsolete. There's something bigger and better in store. Uh, and so when Mormonism tries to project too much of this life onto the next, it's desperately trying to hold on to things that it thinks are is necessary for happiness in the next. It's, it's even exploiting people's anxieties like, oh, no, I'm not going to be with my kids. I'm not going to be with my, my family if I don't get involved in the Mormon church and, and excel, you know, and be temple worthy of the Mormon church. Um, that's just not how Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God, the resurrection. Um, and so the other thing is that Jesus is not answering about the timing of weddings. He's not answering about a technicality about when you ought to get sealed to your spouse in a temple. Jesus is basically answering simplistically, simply, which one will she be married to? And he answers simply, you'll be like the angels. You'll, anyway, that, I don't want to belabor the point, but, uh, if, if families forever means preservation of the nuclear family and preservation of 
uh, marriages here into the into the next life that just doesn't fit with what Jesus teaches. And Jesus's words are authoritative, so they're enough uh, for me. I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to give Joseph Smith a free pass to overturn what Jesus has taught. Right. Yeah. I mean, Paul and Jesus, and yeah, it seems like the the straightforward teaching of the New Testament is that they're not. Um, so so in Kwaku's uh, cross examination cross examination of you. Um, the, the the first part that that little that section was was for a, a little bit that we just discussed and then he made a big he, he kind of went through a series of questions in regards to um, get, does God have uh, a gender you know is God male and you know my 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 guess was and so I'm interested to see what your take was what he's basically saying is if if he's literally a man like he's got female I mean sorry he's got <laughs> male genitalia and, and mm-hmm. therefore he's a man he's gonna he's gonna he's going to want to have sex and, you know, those kind of things. Um, but he, I don't know if you, that seemed the, the point he was trying to make, because basically he was trying to say, God is a man. He's got, you know, he's got body parts like us. We look like him. Um, and, and then he was asking you all these questions about, well, do you think God has a gender? Do you think he's gender non-binary? Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe speak on that for a second. Cause it, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure what his point was. That's what I was trying to sort of give him the benefit of the doubt to see if that's where he was going with it. I think he was going for the rhetorical effect of me, I think he thought I was going to go down the path of affirming that God has a non-binary gender or that Jesus is genderless in the, in in the resurrection Um, or that Jesus is male, but has no more male body parts. So I think he was trying to squeeze out some felt absurdity um, but I didn't, I wasn't willing to go down that path. It, it's not that I wasn't rhetorically willing to go down that path. It's just that I believe Jesus is male and perpetually male in his humanity and that he, uh, uh, I, I don't have any reason to think that he's going to be like a, a Ken Barbie doll. Um, he, I, I think he's going to be male and, um, sorry, this gets into some specific weeds here, but the, the gender specific body parts that men and women have. Um, our genitalia or breasts, they have functions even in this life, even in, even in this pre-resurrection life, they have functions that are, that uh, are specific to the gender that aren't reproductive necessarily. Um, And they accentuate different parts or different aspects of the gender. Um, They have a symbolic significance. They have a functional significance that, um, isn't merely procreative. And so I think we should think in terms of, uh, if that's already somewhat true here, why can't we assume that will be all the more true then in the resurrection? Um, if a couple that is past their season of fertility, um, has functions for those, uh, and even non-sexual, non-romantic functions, even I'm saying, uh, there are non-romantic, uh, non-reproductive purposes for these organs, uh, and so why not? Why not assume that God has that in store for the resurrection? Why not assume that the beauty of the distinct genders will still be at play at the resurrection? Why, you know, that the the being a guy and being being a man is a good thing. Being a woman, being a lady is a good thing, and and uh, it's interesting in. Uh, organizational life in uh, here on earth in a corporation or business uh, there's value to having women in a business there's value to having a diversity of people and personalities and genders in a business um, that have nothing to do with romance or sexual reproduction uh, that, that, that there's something about being a man and a woman that's very different psychologically there's just all you know you could go in the weeds with this, where God means for humanity to function best when they're working together. And that seems like it's a reality that would go into the resurrection. So the other, and to more, maybe, maybe more directly to the point that you're bringing up the questions here, God is not, you know, in Kwaku's view, view God is uh, male or female, and he is a forever reproductive being who begets spirit babies to populate planets. Um, and he needs a wife, at least one wife, uh, to do that. And uh, there's a heavenly mother. And in fact, there's a lot of Latter-day Saints today who 
talk about worshiping Heavenly Mother. Um, Kevin Barney, Mormon scholar, has an article called How to Worship Heavenly Mother Without Being Excommunicated. And uh, the gist of his article is that in Israelite pristine authoritative religion, Asherah, uh, now known as Asherah, was essentially Heavenly Mother or a type of, you know, referring to Heavenly Mother, um, and that God himself was married to Asherah. And he argues that the only reason why Asherah became a no-no, I mean, this is kind of breathtaking for a Christian who's reading the Old Testament, because, you know, a huge aspect of the books of Kings and Chronicles is that the Israelites were paying homage to the Baals and the Asherahs. And there's no sense whatsoever in, in, uh, you know, Asherah is in, uh, associated with a, a Canaanite fertility cult. And in the Old Testament, uh, God doesn't need a wife. He doesn't need uh, a consort. Um, he creates by the effortless authority of the words of his mouth. Uh, he, he's, j- j- this is exciting stuff. It, uh, in Genesis, this is kind of weird to modern ears, but in Genesis, God acts as a sovereign God who is not interacting with an enchanted universe. He's not doing a battle with a, an opponent deity. He's not, um, he's not having, it sounds weird to modern ears, but it's, it was significant when Genesis was revealed that God is not, um, he was not, he didn't have to do any sexually reproductive acts with any other deity to create the, the cosmos. And a lot of origin stories of the, of the cosmos um, in false religions, there was simultaneously given an origin story of one's God. And so you had the gods doing battle. You had the gods doing, uh, you know, emitting, you know, fluids and you had gods, you know, in doing, interacting with an enchanted universe or with other deities in the, in Genesis one, God just speaks, let there be light. He, he is totally ready and sovereign and able to act effortlessly by the word of his mouth. And that's why Christians are so naturally believe in the virgin birth, that the virgin birth narrative makes all the sense in the world to us that when Jesus was conceived, uh, born of a virgin overshadowed by the Holy spirit, God was able to accomplish this miracle in a way that reminds us of the original creation. He is able to create, uh, to, to have Jesus conceived within Mary without any male participation on the part of uh, Joseph. Uh, in fact, there was zero male participation in the miracle of the virginal conception um, because God himself was not male. God, uh, Mormon leaders have taught in the past, it's more rare today to get this explicitly uh, articulated, but, uh, or even believed, um, you you hear this more with older Mormon men, but traditional historic Mormonism taught Mormon leaders taught using various language that heavenly father condescended, uh, with a body and associated with Mary in the capacity of husband and wife. And McConkie taught that Jesus was conceived in just as a natural he was begotten and conceived in just a natural way as any other child was. So the sort of the nudge, nudge, hint, hint idea is that Heavenly Father condescended and had relations with Mary and that Jesus is a specially incarnate being because half of his DNA comes from a mortal and half of his DNA comes from an immortal. And so they extrapolate from this, I know we're off on a rabbit trail here, that the, the atonement here becomes possible in that model because in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is like this demigod Superman who is able to withstand infinite psychophysiological pain. And so the the atonement is really not about the value of the spotless lamb of God slain on the cross. It's about Jesus uh, accomplishing an infinite empathy where with infinite psychophysiological pain, he psychologically internalizes all the pain and suffering of all of humanity, past, present, and future, and all the sins that they, you know, of the sins that they will will have committed. Um, So Jesus is like this demigod Superman uh, begotten. Anyway, back, back to reality. We're back to the original question. 
this only makes sense in Mormonism because God is a man. He is male. And he has a wife, at least one wife. And he, he per perpetually propagates spirit babies. Um, so this, uh, in, in, in the Christian view, gender is not something that is a mysterious furniture of the eternal universe. For Christians, we can give God the glory for the beauty of manhood and womanhood. It's God's idea. And therefore God is prior to gender. He's beneath, or he's above gender, I should say. He's, uh, he created gender. And I don't think Kwaku really, in the, in the line of questioning, I just keep having to say that. He, didn't, he, he kept wanting to kind of go back to, you know, what, God, what gender does God have? And it's like, well, God created gender. He's prior to gender. Does that mean he's gender non-binary? He, he doesn't belong in the LGBTQ plus spectrum. God created humanity. Uh, he, he doesn't have a sexual orientation. God created sexuality. God, it was his idea. It's, it's, it's something we can give him glory for. Mormons can't give God glory for the beauty of manhood. Uh, God ends up just being a mediating influence who organizes manhood and womanhood in some sense, but he's not ultimately responsible in Mormonism uh, for being the artist uh, of, of the beauty of gender or of anything really. Right. I mean, I, what, is, what is, what is he ultimately, I mean, isn't he, is he sort of just a conduit for all of the eternal laws and stuff that he's just kind of a middleman for. And that reminds me. Yes. Yeah. That reminds me of something else in the debate where God, where Kwaku asked me if God was something to the effect of, was he literally our father? In what sense is he our father? Is that merely a metaphor? Is it merely poetry that God is our father? And there's this rhetoric in Mormonism that God is our literal father. And a lot of dialogues at that point just carry on. But I love to just stop and say, what do you mean by that? What, what does it mean for God to be our literal father? And there's a couple senses in scripture in which God is our father. And I don't think Mormonism satisfies any of the senses of scripture for God being our father. There's a passage in Acts 17, where Paul is provoked by the idol, the idols uh, in Athens, and he is he, 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 pretty epic situation where he's able to speak in front of all these philosophically minded uh, Athenians. And he, in order to uh, speak clearly uh, of his Jewish Christian monotheism, what he does is he co-ops or he borrows language from two different works of pagan poetry that they would have been familiar with. And he, Paul says, is it not you know, written that we are the offspring of God and in him we live and move and have our being? And what Paul does is he argues from this that it's therefore not appropriate that we would make statues, for example, of God um, because... And the logic here is interesting. When you, uh, when you create a statue, um, it, it's derivative, it's lesser than you, you're the artist, and uh, it is the art. Well, God made us. Uh, he, in him we live and move and have our being. Um, and in that sense, he is our father. We are his offspring. And if that's the case, it doesn't make sense for us to represent him with things that we make because we're the made things. He's the maker. Uh, uh, things that we make derive from us. And therefore, anything we make would not be a suitable representation of the one who made us. It would be going in the, a different direction. Uh, in fact, earlier in this same text, Paul says, God does not live in temples built with human hands. He's not the kind of, you can't fit God's deity in a room or in a casket. Uh, so why do I bring this up? Mormons use this passage where it says, we are the offspring of God as evidence that heavenly father has at least one wife and that he in premortality quotes here, literally uh, begot us as spirit babies. Now, this 
doesn't really fit the way Paul is using the language because Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. And I, I have to get technical here just for a second. This is geeking out of Mormon <laughs> details. Um, there's a couple different views in Mormonism on what it means to be a literal child of God. In Brigham Young's view, <clears throat> Brigham Young thought that intelligence, I'm using the singular reference to the noun, intelligence is this substance. And from this substance, Brigham Young taught that our heavenly parents begot us. Now, in Brigham's view, we had our genuine beginning at this moment of conception. So uh, you, as an ego, identity, person, subject, self, had your beginning at the conception event of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And, and you were you know, brought into being with this substance called intelligence. That was not the view that became the mainstream Mormon view. That was Brigham Young's view. Joseph Smith had a less developed idea. Joseph Smith seemed to think of intelligences, plural, and spirits, plural, as synonymous. He taught that spirits were co-eternal with God. So Joseph Smith doesn't seem to have developed a theology of what's today called the tripartite model of humans. And, oh, I, well, sorry, there's, uh, in Christian theology, the tripartite model of the human self is body, soul, and spirit. And then the dichotomous view says that soul and spirit are just synonyms. So you really have the, the material self and the immaterial self. In the Mormon context, the tripartite view that I'm speaking of is referring to this, these stages of development where you used to be for an eternity, for an infinite amount of time, you were an ego identity self person called an, an intelligence. So you were an intelligence. You're, you're an individual intelligence. And at the event of, this is the third view here, the tripartite view. At the event of spirit conception between heavenly parents, uh, your heavenly parents, as it were, adopted you from the pool of intelligences and gave you a spirit body. So in this view, uh, you did not have your beginning at spirit conception. Rather, you were clothed with a spirit body. And what's really interesting about this is um, the begetting in this model, this tripartite model. Uh, so I, I'm sorry if I've lost people here. I'm going to summarize real quick here. The, in the Brigham view, intelligence is a substance from which heavenly parents beget you into existence. Your individuality comes into existence. In the Joseph Smith view, there was an underdeveloped or uh, you know less developed view of spirits being co-eternal with God. They did not have a beginning, right? And so the, the third view here, it's called the tripartite view. There were Mormon intellectuals, uh, John Witso, B.H. Roberts, and James Talmadge. Uh, they uh, are responsible for what's called the reconstruction era of Mormon theology, where this tripartite view, I think it was championed by B.H. Roberts, developed. And it's an attempt at synthesizing the view of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. So Joseph Smith thought spirits or intelligences were eternal and they were individualities. Brigham Young's view uh, championed the importance of the spiritual begetting spirit birth event, right? So the synthesis view, which is the mainstream view in Mormonism today, I'm sorry, I'm losing people in the weeds. The synthesis view, the tripartite view, is that you did not have your beginning in the Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother sexual union event. You were merely clothed with a spirit body. You were a co-eternal with God. So what's really interesting about this is you can't give God credit for your fundamental existence in Mormonism. In the, in the deepest way possible, you can't say, in God, 
I live and move and have my being. You can't say that my very fundamental existence is owing to God's creative act or big, even begetting act. Um, rather, it's almost like you're an existing person who was given a spacesuit. Your body was attached, your spirit body was attached to you in this, in this event. And what's really interesting about this is that in the Christian view, um, my whole integrated body, soul, self, uh, I, I take a tr what's called a tradu traducian view where my parents begot me. They didn't merely beget my, my body. They begot me. Um, I, 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 I instrumentally owe my parents uh, for my very existence and ultimately to God. So all this to say, when Mormons say, <laughs> we are literally children of our heavenly parents and God is literally our father, I stop and I say, what do you mean by that? Because a few Mormons I talk to take the Brigham view and they unknowingly take a view that diverges from the mainstream dominant view of Mormon culture for the, from the past hundred years. But the mo most of the Mormons I speak to about this haven't thought about it. And they have to end up saying that God is not the literal father of us. He's the literal father merely of our spirit bodies. And uh, so in Paul's view in Acts 17, God is our father with respect to being our creator. And with respect to being creator, in him we live and move and have our being. We derive our very existence from God. Our fundamental individualities come from God. Mormonism can't even say that. It can't even say that today because it takes the tripartite model especially. So That's on, a, sorry, I'm sorry. Go on that it. view, yeah. all right, so I know, I know we're, we're in the weeds, but this is super interesting. On that view then, we've, everybody who's ever existed has always existed. So there, we didn't come from anywhere. We just have always existed. Yes. You, in fact, you were, you, you spend an infinite amount of time being an individual intelligence before you even became a spirit son of God. So, so it's like, we're all the uncaused first causes. Yes. Which makes no sense. Now, how, I mean, I, I know that, I know they would just say, well, that's deep theology. If you, you'd, if you press them on that, well, you know, where did all of that come from? They would just say, what, that's just, that's always existed. I know this came up, a, this came up at least maybe this, in this section of the debate, I can't remember, but at some point when, when Kwaku was saying that like on your, on, on your, on our Protestant view that, oh, this came up with a problem of evil. Just, you know, Kwaku was saying that, that God is responsible for evil on our view, but in his view, it, it existed prior to him. Um, does he just think that we existed? I mean, if on this, if that's the case, then we all existed at, you know, we're all co-eternal with the, um, with, with, with all of these truths about reality that are also co-eternal with us. Yeah. And I think for Kwaku, that's exciting because it gets, gets God off the hook with respect to theodicy or the challenge of explaining how evil could result from God's pristine creation. In knowingly. one sense, but, it, but then it seems like you, you know, you're out of the frying pan into the fire because now you've got this bigger metaphysical question that you just can't answer. And I guess you could just pun on that and say, hey, well, you know, there's stuff we just can't answer, but I mean, demonstrably it's, it's showing that you can't answer that. I mean, you, there has to be something that's brought that into existence and he's just kind of punting it back one step further. Yeah. Yep. And so agreed. The other sense in, of fatherhood in the scripture is that God adopts us. And there's a famous passage in by Paul in Romans, I think it's eight sixteen, where it says the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And Mormons use this uh, a lot to the language is woven into their manuals and to their verbiage, sort of the, the, the collective consciousness of Mormonism. And, and they use this passage to support the idea that we're literal begotten, you, that we universally, all of us without exception, are begotten by Heavenly Father. It's not really clear if we're all begotten of the same mother. It's kind of interesting, in, you know, poses interesting questions. Are half of us be spiritually begotten of one heavenly mother and half of us begotten of another spiritual mother. But um, the, the the scripture in question, at Romans 6, 16, if you just go up one verse to 8, 8 15, it says, we have the, received this the spirit of adoption. And if you go up another verse, it talks about how those who are led by the spirit are sons of God. So there's this contrast in Romans 8 of those who are led by the spirit and those who live by the flesh. And Paul is thinking of a subset of humanity, not all of humanity, 
who are led by the Spirit, who have received the Spirit of adoption, they can cry out, Abba, Father. They can you know, claim their sonship, their adoptive sonship uh, under the Father. And, and they are co-heirs with Christ. Who And it, it, Mormonism uh, tries to, when you look at the passage and you see how they've misused it, different Mormon scholars take this different ways. Some Mormon scholars say, well, maybe Jesus is adopting us. And it, we're adoptive children of Jesus. And then other Mormon scholars say, well, maybe we're all literal sons and daughters of Heavenly Father, but we got disinherited by him in the fall. But the fall is supposed to be a good thing. So anyway, it's it's interesting thing. So scripturally, though, the, the, you have, a, you have a, a handful of really strong and clear passages about this in the New Testament. We are sons and daughters of God by adoption in Christ under the Father by faith, and we receive the spirit of adoption. And that's the most dominant sense of father, uh, of sonship that we have under our, our Father in heaven uh, in Scripture. Mormonism doesn't really take hold of that, and it doesn't really take hold of the other sense we spoke about. So when, when Kwaku, this was a big, big uh, monologue on my part to get to the original thing. of When Kwaku starts asking me, is God our literal father? That's, that's you know, it, it doesn't make sense in Mormonism for God to even be our literal father in the, in the fundamental sense. And it doesn't really follow the scriptural pattern of being adopted sons and daughters of God. I know I went on a big tangent there, but. But that was, and that was, I mean, that was, that's super interesting. And that was important. I know that was an important, that was an important part of the discussion. I know for you and also for your wife, right? Cause you weren't, because you're quite the way that which Kwaku was questioning whether or not, cause you've adopted, we've adopted as well. Um, that you were saying, you know, no, I am literally uh, their father. And he seemed to be pressing back on that. And then I know your wife uh, kind of challenged him on that a little <laughs> bit after, after the debate. <laughs> yeah. You know, as a, I, I'm, I'm an adoptive parent, so I've got two adopted daughters and they're my, they're literally my daughters. Um, I, I, uh, I did not physically beget them, but they're still literally my daughters. And when you talk, when you talk to people about having adopted kids, um, sometimes well-meaning people say stupid things like, well, who are the real parents? And, and, you know, you know, if you're part of the secular progressive shame culture, you could just own them. Right. And just like, how dare you? But, you know, it's just like, that's, you, you, you know, you kind of gently correct. Well, I am the real parent. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't mean that. Well, it, so Stacy and I have been through the rounds on this and, um, we're, we're pretty vigilant. Sometimes we slip up with language, but we're pretty vigilant about this language. I'm literally their father. They're literally my daughters. I'm the real parent. And uh, adoption, uh, it makes that quite real. And the Bible uh, makes that quite real. And genetic contribution is not essential to me being the real father of my adoptive daughters. And so I, I'm jealous over that language. And my heavenly father is my real father. He's my literal father, if you want to call him that. I'm literally his son by adoption. That's the New Testament category for that. Well, uh, my wife approached Kwaku after the debate. And it kind of explained a little bit about why that language matters to adoptive couples. And uh, that was really interesting. But I, 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 hope, I hope my Latter-day Saint friends here who are listening can have some courage here and go look at the New Testament passages on adoptive sonship. John 1, Romans 8, I think it's Galatians 2 or 3 or 4, I forget, I forget the chapter in Galatians, where he repeats the Romans 8 teaching. Um, Paul teaches, and John 1 teaches, that you can become a child of God, that you're a child of wrath by default nature, but you can become a child of God by faith in Jesus and receive the spirit of adoption. And what's beautiful about the, the adoption metaphor is that um, my daughters did not progressively become my daughters. They did not become 25, 50, and 75% my daughters. They went from being 0% my daughters to 100% legally and fully and permanently my daughters. And, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It, the, the, the family structure language of the New Testament for, Christian, for Christians, so much better than Mormonism. It, it's, it's glorious. Yeah. Um, all right. So, well, so one, all right, so one last thing from Kwaku's cross of you, uh, his final question, is it, is it sinful or wrong to believe in marriage, uh, that the people are gonna be married in heaven? Basically was kind of say, what's the big deal? You know, we believe it, but even if you don't believe it, you know, what's the big deal? Um, what's the harm? 
yeah, what's the harm? And, and you said, yeah, it is. Yeah, it goes against the straightforward teachings of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, who is an apostle, who we should believe every word he wrote in scripture. It goes against the straightforward teachings of Jesus in Matthew 19 and 22, um, the, both chapters. So we should trust Jesus for a social dynamic, for a set of intimate relationships and friendships and a different kind of deeper, better, bigger family in the resurrection that make marriage look boring. And that's where I use the high school metaphor, where high school is a pretty intense, dramatic, beautiful season of life. Some, for some people, it's not so beautiful, but for, for many people, actually, it's a great memory. It's a really impactful, spiritually formative time of life. And, uh, you know, you look back and, you know, you have special memories from high school and it's a gift from God. High school is a gift from God, but you graduate and you, you get to a point where you say, I wouldn't want to go back. I've got better things now. And heaven will be like that. Res the resurrection will be like that. You won't want to go back to marriage. Marriage will seem small and inadequate uh, for the kind of resurrection, joy, community, power, holiness, knowledge that we'll have. Certain categories don't persist into the resurrection or certain categories in the, on earth point to bigger categories uh, at the resurrection, namely Christ's uh, relationship with his church is described in terms of husband and wife. Yeah, that's a good, this is, that's a good analogy. I've heard you use it a couple of times now, but uh, I'm going to co-opt co that from you. Um, uh, we, we mentioned lots of, uh, we've, we've, we've hit on a lot of things that you went over in your cross-examination. The last, the, the thing that we didn't talk about that this was, I think this was the last thing that came up in the cross right near the, near the end. Um, your question to him, was it ethical for Joseph Smith and Brigham Young to, you know, to have sex with plural, with plural wives. And, and then you kind of, and then you asked him if uh, Joseph Smith met the qualifications of an elder from first Timothy and from Titus and um, you know what he said? Yes. Right. Um, so maybe just, I don't know, maybe talk about that section uh, for a minute. Cause I thought that was, that was a pretty interesting uh, exchange. Yeah, I lost my debate notes for the questions in part three. Yeah. So when I started this section, did you ever, did you ever like, find them, or do you, are they are they lost in the? Uh, I found them on Google Docs, but they never got yeah. printed. Okay. So, uh, or at least they, if they got printed, I never found them um, in print. But I um, was really going down the path. So when I asked him about Paul in First Corinthians seven, he just threw Paul into the bus. And so the the, the reason we kind of went down that path was. Um, how seriously do you take your own, you know, how bad do you think your own apostles and prophets were with respect to their teachings and their living out of marital stuff? Um, the New Testament seems to elevate the ethical requirements for leadership. So in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy 3, Paul outlines qualifications for leadership in the local church. And uh, he, exp he, he, he seems to speak as though an elder will typically already have children. They, they'll, they'll be typically able to demonstrate their proven leadership qualities through the management of their own household, including a wife and kids. Now, Paul doesn't have a wife and kids that we know about, you know, from a, we, we don't know that he, we have every, you know, maybe he was single, maybe, or maybe he had a wife and his wife left him when he became a Christian. We don't know. But, um, we don't have any reason to think Paul is married or has kids and yet he's able to function in leadership, but there is a normal general expectation that the typical leader is going to be old enough to have wife and kids. And Paul uses this language, like they have to be a one woman man and it's an idiom and it seems to rule out polygamy. It seems to rule out uh, marital unfaithfulness, serial monogamy. It seems to rule out uh, the kind of lifestyle that calls into question your not living up to the exclusive nature of monogamy. And, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like the authoritative texts in the New Testament on these issues are taken seriously by Mormons at all. So, I mean, the, there's in terms of like building a marriage ethic or building a, a theology or a model of what the importance of marriage is and the, you know, it, questions of perpetuity around marriage or family, the nuclear family, um, those are based on, you know, revel, you know, revealed scriptures. 
and Mormonism doesn't seem to take them very seriously. So that was kind of pointing that out and going down the path of he seems to have threw Paul under the bus. Well, would he throw Joseph Smith under the, under the bus with respect to marriage ethics? Um, yeah, and so Joseph, and qu- we didn't really get far to this. This was just kind of a, a one-off thing. But um, a lot of Latter-day Saints think that Joseph Smith had platonic uh, sealing relationships with his plural wives that were merely sort of anticipatory of sexual relationships in the resurrection, but not living out sexual plurality of wives relationships in this life. So a lot of Latter-day Saints try to soften the blow by saying, well, maybe all of these plural wives were sealed to him after he died as post-mortem sealings, or maybe he did seal himself to other wives in this life, but maybe he did it, you know, with Emma's consent and maybe it wasn't consummated in this life. The problem is, is that the more you look at the details of Joseph Smith's life, the more there's, there's some books that sort of the go-to guys are Todd Compton. He wrote a book called in sacred loneliness, the sacred, the, the wives of Joseph Smith. And there's a series of books by Brian C. Hales, Brian C. Hales. He is a, you know, front and center scholar who is a faithful Mormon. He loves Mormonism. He loves Joseph Smith. He defends Joseph Smith. He's in the mainstream uh, of Mormonism. <clears throat> and he wrote a series of books going through the different details of the wives of Joseph Smith. And he takes a more benefit of doubt, positive, optimistic view of Joseph Smith. And a guy like Dan Vogel is a little more pessimistic, a lot more pessimistic. And a guy named uh, Todd Compton is more moderate on this. Anyway, when you look at the details of this, Joseph Smith is largely doing this without the consent or knowledge of Emma Smith. It looks like he had an adulterous relationship with Fanny Alger uh, when she was 16 years old. Uh, it looks like there was evidence of the adultery even. That's why Emma kicked her out of the house. She was 16 years old. Um, it doesn't even look like Joseph Smith had really developed that much of a theology of polygamy at the time. It just looks like straightforward adultery. Although Mormon scholars try to retrofit later developed theology of polygamy back into this earlier year. Um, it looks like Joseph Smith married two 14 year olds, two 16 year olds, two mother daughter pairs. It looks like he had sexual relationships with about, you know, at least 10 of them. Um, when the scholar that came over to my, the host home that I was living in, in the basement apartment, when, when he came over years ago, I asked him about Joseph Smith's sexual relationships with his plural wives. And he was like, oh yeah, they had honeymoons. So, I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't look like Joseph Smith by New Testament standards, by elevated New Testament ethical standards, lived out the one woman wife, sorry, the one man woman. So, okay, I can't say that. One wife, man, one woman, man, uh, ethical standard that Paul gave for church leadership. And Mormons even seem to be really squeamish and embarrassed about that. Uh, J- J- Quaker just kind of waved it off, but yeah. He said, do you asked him, did Joseph Smith fail the test, the New Testament test of being a one woman man? And he said, no. He said, Joseph Smith, yeah, he had he had some sex with some different women, but he didn't burn people, light them on fire, because he then he kind of was going back to his uh, attack of Protestantism, which we talked about last time, um, which is interesting. Um, all right, so uh, that was the end of, of of the cross examination time. Each of you had a, a closing statement. Um, maybe just his. Just we can talk about this briefly. Um, he he looked at uh, Second Nephi. Uh, chapter 29, and it basically it seemed like he was he was basically saying that hating, based on this on this text, hating Jewish people um, is equating it with the idea of only needing the Bible. And so he says that basically the Book of Mormon is saying that if you if you only if you think you only need the Bible, then you're also going to hate the Jews. And he said therefore we got Protestantism, and the Protestant history is just you know there's no fruit there, lots of lots of evil, um, and so. Uh, yeah. And then he basically, he said that someone who believes all Jews are in, you know, who you have on the stage is me. And then someone who believes that all Jews are in hell, which I was referring to you. Um, and then he said, Jesus is enough to save you from all of those beliefs. And that was his uh, closing statement. So any, any sort of just reactions or comments on, on that? So, um, summarizing here, it seems like Quaku's position 
is that if you hold the Bible up to be the authoritative, inspired, verbally inspired word of God as a uniquely uh, revelatory, authoritative source of revelation, if you hold to Sola Scriptura, or if you hold to the, the closed canon, Kwaku seems to think that if you hold that, a natural step from that will be becoming a fan of mass murder uh, or uh, what were the other things he mentioned? Um, racism. Yeah, sla American slavery, racism. I mean, he's... He's, he thinks that sola scriptura or hold, having the Bible as your authority puts you in, in, the, in the stream of eventually endorsing uh, horrific things. Um, this just, one observation is this doesn't sound like the classical LDS argument for their own belief system. Uh, it doesn't sound like a genuine effort at, giving a positive case for his own belief system. Um, it, it just seems like a smear. Uh, it sounds like he didn't really give us a genuine savior to adore and to be excited about. It sounded like his biggest thing was just smearing Protestantism or, you know, calling attention to the, to the sins of Protestant reformers. Um, Whereas I uh, made a distinction between who I will throw under the bus and who I won't, right? So I'm going to throw under the bus any, any person who's not a prophet or apostle who is diverging from scripture. And what I won't throw under the bus is a prophet or apostle. I will, I will obediently and submissively put myself under their inspired words. Um, I will harmonize as best as I can all that they teach, and I will seek to obey it. And I will not, I refuse to be a part of a religion that has to throw its apostles and prophets under the bus. And in Kwaku's view, he throws his prophets, I mean, in practice, I should say, he throws his prophets and apostles under the bus. And he thinks that I have a heritage of Protestant reformers that have to be thrown under the bus. And therefore, Protestantism is somehow false. So, yeah, it, it, it just felt like a rhetorical dig out of the emotional exchange that we had earlier. It didn't seem like a, didn't, it didn't seem like a good faith effort at really pointing us to the, the good things that his religion would seemingly have to offer. Or even going back to the, to the uh, points that we're supposed to be talking about in the debate, you know, is Jesus enough for, so I mean, his, his closing remark is Jesus is enough to save you from all of these beliefs, but um, yeah, it wasn't really giving a positive, like you said, not giving a positive case for, for his position. Um, your closing statement, you know, you, you seem to focus on, and so I'll give you kind of a chance to, to just maybe give a broad overview of it, but, but even if, you know, basically speaking to the Latter-day Saints, I think very pastorally, even, look, even if Mormonism crashes, you, can, you still can have Christ, and that this idea that, that if, if and when you start having doubts of, uh, on, on your Mormonism, don't throw away Jesus just because you've been sold a bill of goods um, that come to the true Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's hard not to tear up a little bit, just thinking about people who have been down the rabbit hole of disillusionment with Mormon history. When they learn about Joseph Smith, <clears throat> when they learn about the funny business that's gone on in Mormon history by prophets and apostles, um, that's a deep hole. That's a, that's a painful path to go down. And that's, and that's like people have to start thinking about leaving a community. They have to start thinking about, is their spouse going to divorce them? They have to start thinking about, well, you know, maybe I've got kids and they say, well, what do I give my kids now? Like I had something to give them, a structure, you know, foundation. What do I base my eternity on now? Like I want I need a good relationship with God. How do, where do I go from here? And Mormonism, uh, it crashes and burns for people and it primes people for a lot of cynicism toward Christianity and the Bible. And so my pleading with the audience, the Latter-day Saint audience was that they can have all of Jesus without Joseph Smith. And if you have all of Jesus, you have everything you need. 
It's not like Jesus gives you 90% and Joseph Smith gives you, you know, the last 10%. If you have all of Jesus, you have everything you need. Jesus offers you something so much better in terms of salvation. He seals you up to eternal life. He seats you in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ today by faith. Um, Jesus assures you of a new, better, bigger family that doesn't require a successful marriage on your part. It doesn't require you being sealed in the temple to your wife. It doesn't require um, that your whole nuclear family makes the spiritual varsity team so you can all be together forever. Uh, Jesus gives you reason not to have any anxieties about social relationships in the afterlife. He, he, it, it, there's a doctrine that Paul gives us in the new Testament of unity with Christ or union with Christ uh, being, if you, if you wanted to reread the new Testament and look out for it, it's language like being in Christ prepositions like that in Christ being in Christ. And in Paul's theology, if you're in Christ, you are under an umbrella of all the blessings of being connected to him. Now, one of the blessings of being connected or united, I would say sealed to Christ, to use Mormon language, sealed to Christ by faith, is that you are sealed consequently to everyone else who is sealed to Christ by faith. You're a part of a new family now, and you can, because of God's power, because of what God has said in scripture, you can be confident that he's going to give you pleasures forevermore, not second rate pleasures, not second, third kingdom pleasures, but first rate seated with Christ, eternal life, joy in the highest and deepest way possible forever, progressively better forever in Christ. No Joseph Smith needed for that. And in Christ, um, you can be a part of a kingdom that Jesus has planted that does not need to be uprooted, never needed to be. You can be a part of a kingdom that won't be shaken, uh, a church that won't die, a church that won't be prevailed against, a church that Jesus himself builds and protects and nourishes. You can be a part of a flock that is protected by Jesus as the good shepherd. Um, so Jesus is better in every respect to anyone who is worried about leaving Mormonism, worried about being let down by Joseph Smith and let down. I mean, a lot of Mormons, they have good parents that love them and taught them Mormonism because they really believed it. And they really thought that was the best they could offer them. And they loved their kids. They did, this is not out of malice. And when you come to realize that Joseph Smith was a fraud, you're in the situation where you're going to have to have a broken, hurt, strained, painful relationship with your parents who love you often, with your siblings, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your whole community. And what I'm trying to say to people is, Jesus is better. He's worth, he's worth all the pain. He is worth the disillusionment with Mormonism. Uh, Jesus, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Paul says in Colossians, are in Christ Jesus. All of it. All, the treasure box is not withheld from you. You will be a part of the one house. Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms. And he wasn't saying that to threaten you, to send you off to a separate kingdom. He's talking about the multiplicity and the spaciousness and the availability of having yet more room for you to come inside his house and to be with the father and with Jesus and with his people forever. And so that, that was what I was trying to plead with my Mormon audience to, to consider and also to plead with my Christian audience to better appreciate. And I, you know, I, I with a full throated pleading, yell, if you want to call it that, a scream of pleading love. I told them to spit Joseph Smith out of their mouths like poison and uh, to skip general conference and to gorge themselves on the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus. Jesus says things like, my words are full of the spirit and of life. And Jesus says to his disciples, and I think it's John 15, he says, you are already clean because of the words I've spoken to you. And Jesus says, whoever hears my words and believes me, who sent, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. Jesus is delivering the goods here through his words to be simply received by faith. And if you would just empty your hands of all all your efforts at being worthy and declare spiritual bankruptcy 
and receive this all sufficient, all satisfying Jesus, you will have everything you need because Jesus is enough. Yeah. Amen. I must, well, I want to, I want, we should just end there if I was, if I was a good host, but I've got one question from the Q and a that I think is that's, that comes from this um, based on, I mean, on this discussion, uh, there were some, you know, there were some other, lots of other questions in the Q and a, and if there's any of them that you want to kind of, that you want to address, we can, but one of the questions um, was about families being forever. And the question was about uh, essentially was what about kids who don't make, you know, who, who aren't, who don't make exaltation. Um, so technically that family wouldn't be forever. And Kwaku, he basically, he just seemed to say, yeah, everyone is sealed together forever. Like he kind of just seemed like he kind of just went around it. Um, so I'd like you to address that. But then you actually, in your, in your response, you mentioned the divine tentacles quote. And so I wondered if you maybe just uh, expand on that a little bit, what, what that is and then how that, you know, has plays into to the answer to this question. Yeah. So, um, let me pull up the quote real quick here. There's a famous quote in Mormonism that's kind of made its way through Mormon history. And <clears throat> let's see here. It's by Orson F. Whitney. I'm going to read it here. Orson F. Whitney, a Mormon leader, says in General Conference, Though some of the sheep may wander, the eye of the shepherd is upon them. And sooner or later, they will feel the divine will feel the tentacles of divine providence reaching out after them and drawing them back to the fold. So even though Mormonism has placed a premium on free agency, um, at times it's treated sealing as Calvinistic. And that, so what I'm about to say here to a student of modern Mormonism or to a Mormon will sound absolutely crazy. Like, like, what are you talking about? You're making stuff up. So I'll just make some historical claims and I'll invite people to go uh, falsify them or vindicate them. Early Mormon views of sealing. Uh, so the second anointing, for example, that I spoke of earlier, which is this extra sealing ceremony. Um, it's it's uh, given to the upper echelons of LDS leadership today. The separate second sealing ceremony today used to be kind of more integrated into the original sealing stuff in Mormonism. And there was a virtual assurance built into it of being with your family and being exalted in the highest level of the celestial kingdom. Short of committing murder. That was sort of the asterisk. As long as you don't commit murder. So um, there was this, I, I said it's almost like Calvinistic because it has this virtual sense of eternal security built into it. And Mormon ceiling has kind of had that flavor to it at times in Mormon culture. And it's uh, modulated, it's tempered by the occasional reminder that all your kids need to be fully worthy in order to individually appreciate the benefits of being sealed. So it's like, if you really want to go to the celestial kingdom, you need to be sealed and you need to live up to the covenant keeping obedience requirements of keeping the commandments and being worthy and qualified and meriting eternal life. And if they do that, they will make the spiritual varsity team as it were, and then you'll be together. But that qualification that your kids need to be, need to fully earn eternal life or fully earn exaltation is sort of a, a reminder that comes every so often, but the way it's experienced, it, it's just kind of this weird phenomena in Mormonism where even if your son becomes a raging God hating atheist, you politely ask him not to take your name off the membership rolls. You, 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 you want him to stay a member and the hope sort of the background hope is that he'll be pulled back into, you know, faithful Mormonism and sealing it's, it, this is just like, it's, it's just in human psychology here. It's like, even if you tell someone, um, this ordinance isn't effective unless you fulfill these other requirements. And yet people kind of try to appreciate the assurances that come from the ordinance itself. Like they're sealed. So I think we'll be better off. I think, you know, we were sealed in the temple. So 
There's this idea that the, the tentacles of divine providence will pull back your sealed children into the family. So James E. Faust, <clears throat> Mormon apostle in uh, general conference, gave one of those reminders and said, your children need to be to fully earn exaltation. Exaltation must be fully earned, earned. So it's a reminder that your kids can't join you unless they all make the same var spiritual varsity team. Uh, yeah. I hope that helps kind of give some perspective, but uh, in order, in order for this whole game plan to work, everyone's got to get an A on the report card. So, I mean, do you think uh, Quaker was just being, he was being dishonest? Do you think he was, sort of his Oh, with respect to the singularity of the, of the great grand human family? Well, is that, so is he just saying, I mean, is he saying that we're all kind of sealed together? So it's not like we're, cause he, he said, look, we're not like we have our own patch of land. So is he saying, oh. well, you're sealed with, all of the other Mormons or is he saying? Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't a directly answer your question. I apologize. Um, so I have heard from Latter-day Saints that the grand vision of Mormonism is that everybody would be sealed together in some fashion, in some connected, indirect way. Um, so a little, little bit more Mormon historical craziness. Sealings in the earliest season of Mormonism we're more about kingdom building. Um, and so you had more adoptive ceilings where men were being sealed to men, not sexually, not romantically, not maritally. But for example, there were a whole lot of men that were sealed to Joseph Smith, or a whole lot of men sealed to Brigham Young. And it was like kind of preparing your baseball team for the kingdom building stuff later. And so ceilings really didn't take a very sappy, sentimental, nuclear fo family focus, as I, as I read Mormon history, they didn't take that focus until the early 1900s. And that's when adoptive ceilings stopped. Um, so uh, there, there is a, there, but there is a, like an original scheme of sealing up the whole human family together not simply through unity with Christ, but through a chain, sort of a, a, a hierarchical chain or an overlapping mesh or network of ceilings that eventually sort of like links in a chain, bind all the human families together. So it, what Kwaku said might be technically true in one sense, but um, he what he's doing there is he's underrepresenting the sales pitch of Mormonism where you have you know, an ad, a Mormon ad, classically called Mormon, where you have a family around a Thanksgiving table where you have mom and dad and you have the sentimental sort of view of your kids around the table and you're all, you know, folding your arms to pray. Or you're all just, you know, having these beautiful moments together or your grandparents are there, right? And so the, the traditional appeal to being with your family forever is the nuclear family being sealed together and then overlapping with future and prior generations of nuclear families. So, so there's a kind of chain concept there, but there's not this more straightforward singular, singular family focus there. I went to a Sunstone symposium. Sunstone is like a, it's a yearly symposium, I guess when there's not a pandemic, but, um, uh, of Mormon liberal intellectuals. Yeah, you talked uh, about this last oh. time. That's what, um, what's his name? The Mormon stories guy was, you were talking about, you, you talked to John Delin. John Delin. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I, sorry, I won't set it up anymore, but yeah. at, I went to a symposium where they were talking about all the difficulties of Mormon ceilings. And it, it almost sounds like the Sadducees kind of coming up with all the different difficulties of marital ceiling or marital perpetuation, where they were talking about, well, what if, what if your, your husband, um, you know, is sealed to you and you you're sealed to your kids, but your husband dies and you want to get sealed to another man. And so you get your prior sealing via permission nullified. And then you have all these kids now that who were sealed to a couple that's no longer sealed. And so they, they kind of went through some scenarios that complicate things. <laughs> they make things really messy with ceilings. And these are kind of more liberal-esque Mormons that are willing to think outside the box or be on the fringes of Mormon theology. And so at the end of their talk or at the end of their presentations, 
towards the end of them. They were they were more like, well, maybe it's more like just being one big interconnected family, you know, through ceilings. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's really not about who you're sealed to. Maybe it's more about being sealed. And if you're if you're sealed to someone, it just shows your faithfulness, and you can just trust God with the details later on. And maybe it won't really matter in terms of nuclear families in the end, because maybe we'll just all be one big human family. And as a Protestant sitting in the audience, I was like, oh, this is like, you know, like it, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like reaching for what the Bible already gives me in Christ for free, with unity in Christ. So I think Ukwaku was underrepresenting though the nuclear family focus that modern Mormonism has with respect to ceilings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know any, any other questions. I mean, there's lots of other, you know, there's like, there was a bunch of other questions. A lot of them we've talked about, I think during the different points in the, in the breakdown, any other of those questions that you felt, you know, really that you wanted to kind of flesh out more or, you know, flesh out even your answer. Is there anything else in the Q and a that comes to mind? Like I know there was, you mean the yeah in the Q and A? That's what I was saying. The questions. I mean, um, it's, I mean there was the question. I kind of we can walk through them, but um, the first question was basically about Molinism, which we, you know we kind of talked about, and then there was one on works and faith, um, and then a guy was basically trying to. Another question was about Romans one and the King Follett discourse, and he was trying to ask how come Joseph Smith wasn't a a reprobate based based on Romans one. Uh, the question on the great apostasy, um, uh, another one on, um, oh yeah, I mean, and we talked about this, I guess, last time about, you know, if John, it, this, this is, if, you know, if John was on the earth, the apostle John, how could there be a great apostasy? And, and, and you, you know, you went through the, the, the discussion last time about the thick and thin definition, but, but Kwaku said that the priesthood being taken from the earth was the great apostasy, but wasn't John a priest? He had the priesthood yeah. and the three Nephites. So, so then, yeah. how can they say the priesthood was taken from? Because he was the. How can they say that it was taken from the earth when he was on the earth and had An still apostle, had priesthood? Yeah. yeah, still had priesthood authority. Yeah, I don't have in mind how they get around that. Yeah, but, uh, I don't know. I just yeah, thought of that. I thought of that when I was listening to his answer because it seemed. I don't know. The, um, what about this? This came up, um, Bob Vukovic, who's, uh, I think, because most of the questions were from, uh, I think, were from Christians, um, except for the one guy who was asking you about predestination. I mean, some of the questions were just on predestination and I think just not understanding, you know, how that how that worked. Um, what was yeah, the, Robert, um, Bob? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Robert Vukic, he is a frenemy. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, he's a frenemy. He's a... Uh, he is a longtime dialogue partner. We did a, We actually did a debate on the miracle of forgiveness by Spencer W. Kimball. It's on YouTube. Um, so he tried to paint Paul as a racist by pointing to Titus one, where uh, I think Paul says of the Cretans, even their own prophet has said, what does he say? Even their, their, one of their own has said, or something to that effect, the Cretans are evil beasts, gluttons, list, like a vice list. And he generalizes the Cretan people as having this problem. I'll just read it for it real quick. Um, he says, um, it was, oh, whoops, I'm in the wrong one. Sorry. I was, I was like, that's not what he said because I was, I was in Timothy. Um, let's see. He said, it says, uh, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then he says, this testimony is true. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so Bob was trying to say, basically, you know, what about the, he said, what about the racist statements that Paul made? And he, and he pointed this as a racist statement that Paul was making. So I think there's a ton of Latter-day Saints that would read that and say, oh, that's not racist. It's not rooted in uh, ethnicity. It's not actually tying um the vice list to a, with a direct connection to the uh immutable characteristics yeah of the um, ethnicity or something like that yeah yeah and it's interesting that people have different sensibilities about whether or not you can generalize a people as having um a vice disposition or problem what struck struck me as interesting is that kwaku seemed quite uh, at least with respect to groups of people, not necessarily ethnicities, uh, he was willing to paint Protestants in a certain light. He was willing to say certain groups of people 
you know, had dispositions to certain sins or something like that. Um, what's interesting about here about Paul is he's quoting one of their own prophets. Um, he is writing a letter to Titus, who is in Crete, if I understand correctly. It's an, it's an island, and he's he's helping them do church planning stuff. He's helping them do, you know, to develop leadership around a local church in Crete. Uh, he went to Crete and he preached the gospel. Um, Paul doesn't think the gospel is unavailable to the Cretans, uh, nor does nor does he in the end paint them as being uh, fundamentally more corrupt than the rest of humanity. Um, so I, I just don't think it's it, it really fits the a robust def, definition of racism. More interesting thing here is though that both so Robert was okay throwing Paul under the bus as a racist. And I think he was doing this on the heels of Kwaku throwing Paul under the bus for purportedly being a sexist. And Paul Kwaku's res, Kwaku's sort of response to the Bob question didn't seem like he was critical of it. So, you know, you walk away with the impression that Kwaku agrees that prophets in scripture have been sexists, racists. Um, you know, it kind of raises the question of whether or not Kwaku is going to hold on to, or is even now holding on to what the scriptures say about sexual ethics, um, uh, uh, with respect to positions on same sex marriage or like that. So, yeah. And you kind of, you pushed him on that in the, uh, cross examination. Yeah. He seemed really uncomfortable answering questions about it. Um, so uh, I remember one question where Kwaku tried to give the impression that Latter-day Saint theology teaches that Heavenly Father was not a sinner in a pre-mortality. Yeah, that's the second to last question. Yeah, um, uh, a, a guy, he brought up, because he actually said, well, you quoted Second Nephi 29 to Kwaku, but they said if you go on later on, it says God is the same yesterday, uh, today, and forever. And he's basically saying, well... Um, you know, so how could so the guy? The question was, well, how could that be true of the LDS uh, Heavenly Father if he was a man and you know, um, grow, you know, became God and all these other things? And well, it was interesting. Quaku said, well, I'd say Jesus, right? And so then he says, uh, which is interesting. I just think uh, every time I've talked, you know, the conversations I've had, they they want to equate God. Uh, the, the Godhead with Jesus. So if something Jesus does something, then um, anyway, I thought that was interesting. But then he basically said. Um, you were kind of pushed him on this, and, and he said, he said that uh, Heavenly Father did not sin in uh, when he was uh, that he said that yeah that he, Heavenly Father didn't sin. Um, I, that's so maybe we want to maybe address that a little bit. But how could that be the case? I mean, how could because even my understanding was even even in his world he would need some kind of savior, right? <clears throat> so. Um, side note, in our prior debate, I asked in a cross-examination, I asked Kwaku if he thought Heavenly Father could have been a sinful mortal. And if I remember correctly, he said, I don't know. I, I don't remember prior to this last debate, Kwaku ever taking a solid position that Heavenly Father was never a sinner. So w within the within Mormonism, you have two positions, basic positions. One is that Heavenly Father... Uh, per the Lorenzo Snow couplet, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. Heavenly Father lived a mortal probation that is imitable by us and serves as a paradigm or a pattern for us to uh, live. It's encouraging. So I, I, I did a, a video interview project. It's called GodNeverSinned.com. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, see, yeah, it's on your, it's on your uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, and I asked Mormons, do you think Heavenly Father perhaps was a sinful mortal? And about one-third of them say no, but two-thirds of them say something like yes or maybe or probably. Um, and so I asked Mormons, well, how does that make you feel? And a lot of Mormons would say th things like, well, it makes me feel good because if I'm a sinner and you know, if, if Heavenly Father was a sinner and he became a god, well, I'm a sinner. That gives me hope that I could become a God. It makes Heavenly Father more relatable. It makes him more empathetic with my position because if I'm a sinner and he was a sinner, he knows what I'm going through. And it gives me hope that it's realistic to become a God. So um, 
you get this out of this theology of the one eternal round of as man is, God once was, as God as man may be. God was once a man as we are now, Joseph Smith taught. And so it really raises the question of just how strong the parallel is. As man, uh, as man is, God once was. Well, man is a sinner. Was God once a sinner? And so some Mormons uh, see the parallel as very strong, that Heavenly Father was probably a sinner. That's the, that's the position of Alonzo Gaskill, BYU professor. Heavenly Father was probably a sinner. Uh, other Mormons say, well, there's a parallel to be drawn there between our, us and Heavenly Father, but um, only, it only goes so far. Maybe it's that, that simply he lived a mortal life, not that he was a sinner. So um, Joseph Smith in the King Follett Discourse, uh, he doesn't seem to take a clear position on whether Heavenly Father was a sinner. But more interesting to me, um, the way Latter-day Saints have construed the sermon has not typically been to say that Heavenly Father... I'll try to set this up. There's a passage in John 5, verse 19. The context is Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And the and the the Pharisees are really upset because only God's allowed to work on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus is like, well, my father's working now and I'm working too. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you trying to say you're equal with God? And Jesus doesn't say no. He just says, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. So the, the, the effect of the passage is the, the prerogative that the father has to work on the Sabbath, which is a divine prerogative, is a prerogative that Jesus also has. And it's played out in the life of Jesus doing special miracles on the Sabbath that are a kind of non sabbatarian work that he has special unique privileges to do. So this is really pointing to the deity of Jesus Christ. It's pretty cool. Uh, but what Jesus says is essentially, and this, this, this goes deep into the deity of Jesus. He doesn't say, I only do what I see my father doing. No, he goes beyond that. He goes, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. And it's in the present tense. What the son, what the father is doing, doing, the son uh, is, the son can, you know, is seeing. So there's a, there's an acting, a, a speaking. There are words and actions that the father is doing in John five. And the son is beholding his father. He's watching as it were, it's a metaphor. He's watching and seeing and listening to his father. And he only speaks the words that the father gives him to speak. And he only does the things that the father is working in him to do. And he only does what he sees actively in the present tense, the father doing. So why did he heal that man on the Sabbath? Well, he was just watching what his father was doing. He was doing what his father was working in him. He was speaking the words that the father gave him to speak. So the way that some Mormons have taken hold of this verse is that Jesus has learned from the father's past mortal probation that Jesus in a prior season of life, I'm sorry, that the father, that the father in a prior season of life, in a mortal probation, in an experience, an earthly experience that the father has, has himself had in a prior season of life, played the role of a sinless savior. And that what Jesus is doing in this life, when he was here on earth, is that he was replicating what the father did when he condescended to another earth to play the role of a sinless savior. So because Joseph Smith uses the verse, he doesn't use it to argue that Jesus, that he doesn't use it to author that the father was the savior or that the father was sinless, but Mormons construe it that way. But, but it, it becomes a kind of safety fallback for some Mormons like, ooh, this Lorenzo Snow couplet stuff, this the traditional Mormon theology suggests Heavenly Father may have been a sinful mortal who needed the blood of another Savior, who submitted to a Heavenly Grandfather as one who forgave his sins. And so what some, about a th in my experience, about a third of the Mormons I speak to lean toward that position. They more so take that position. And they say that Jesus was learning from the Father who was a sinless Savior 
And so this, this, this really consequently gives you a logical worldview where in the genealogy of the gods, there are some like us who are sinners who can become gods. So in the larger genealogy of gods, like even for this generation of people, you have billions of sinners that can become gods. But you have a strain or a line, like a lineage of certain people within the genealogy of the gods who are able to become gods without ever having sinned. Sorry if this is getting deep. <laughs> so it doesn't solve the problem. It still, uh, it still paints a picture where some of the gods, many of the gods who are exalted over other spirit kids in the universe were once sinners and they're demanding worship from their own progeny and claiming to be holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're claiming to have never sinned. So a lot of Mormons will reason, well, maybe Heavenly Father was a sinner, but having been cleansed by the blood of his savior is rendered as one as though he never sinned. It, you know, his sins were removed from him as far as the East is from the West. His sins will be remembered no more. So we should treat heavenly father. If he was a sinner, we should treat him as though he never sinned because the blood of another savior would have wiped his sins out. And so what I get accused of by Mormons, this is really, really fascinating. Mormons will say, Aaron, if you don't believe Heavenly Father could have been a sinner, you're denying the power of the atonement. And they're not talking about Jesus's atonement. They're talking about the abstract concept of atonement accomplished by different saviors throughout different generations of the gods. They're saying, I'm denying the, pow the potential power of the atonement of a savior who would have cleansed Heavenly Father's sins. Whew. So other Mormons take the position that, you know, he maybe Heavenly Father was sinless and they go of John 5, 19. So what I've had issues with is that Mormons just aren't honest about this. And the honest position is Mormonism is suggestive that he may have been a sinner, but it doesn't really clarify if among all the gods of the universe who were sinners was Heavenly Father one of them, or was he like Jesus? Mormonism doesn't give us an official position on that. It just gives us some touch points. It doesn't really give us confidence that Heavenly Father was always holy. So some Mormon apologists have taken it upon themselves, like Kwaku seemingly did in this last debate, to argue that the single position of Mormonism, the authoritative official position, is that Heavenly Father never was a sinner. And they make reference to John 5, 19, and the King Follett discourse, uh, you, the King Follett discourse's usage of the passage. So I, I point to a quote by Rodney Turner. I'm sorry, this is weeds. Rodney Turner is a BYU professor, and he addresses this uh, in a book um, where he talks about how the, the John 5, 19 parallel was never meant by Joseph Smith to imply that the father played the role of a sinless savior. And I, I, I try to remind Mormons that they don't really have an official position on this and that they are swimming in a sea of fellow Mormons two thirds of which believe heavenly father either maybe was probably was, or definitely was a sinful mortal. And also this gets bad. The only sins that permanently disqualify someone from becoming exalted as a God in the future are blasphemy against the Holy ghost and murder. So it is within the realm of possibility that apart from those two sins, heavenly father may have committed every uh, you know, imaginable sin possible, uh, you know, and then come to repentance and confess his sins to a bishop and been cleansed by the blood of a savior. He could have been a horrific sinner. Um, and I, I want people to realize that so that when they're singing to God, holy, 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 you know, that's the God that Mormons are potentially worshiping here. Whereas Christians are a hundred percent confident. God never was a sinner. Kwaku is absolutely, uh, misleading to give any impression that Mormonism gives a solid, absolute official position on when he on whether heavenly yeah, I mean, father was a sinful mortal. Just, just blasphemy to say, to say that God was a, God could sin. Um, well, um, well, this has been great, man. This is, this has been really, I mean, even just all three episodes, just walking back through this and um, it's been really cool to kind of just pick your brain and, uh, and just learn more about taking these topics and just deep diving. Thank yeah. you for everything.
Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Present Day Saint. Just again, want to thank Aaron uh, for uh, three episodes of more than most. And um, yeah, so I just I appreciate you and I appreciate all the work that you did preparing for this debate and hope you realize how uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to benefit the kingdom now that it's out there on, you know, on, online and um, people will see it for, you know, for years to come. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for everything. Thank you for sponsoring the event and helping me debrief and process how it went. Thank yeah. you for everything. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Present Day Saint. Just again, want to thank Aaron uh, for uh, three episodes of intense debrief. I know that uh, if you listen to all three of those, I mean, what was that like six hours almost of um, of intense debrief? But I think it was worthwhile, and I hope it was something that helped you, that edified you, that you learned a lot. I know I did. Uh, Aaron is a wealth of information. We'll hope to get him back on the podcast on a consistent basis because he's just got so much information and has been doing this for so long and just a great person to learn from and uh, just just yeah, just a great person all around. So again, thanks for listening to this episode of uh, The Present Day Saint. If you like what you're hearing, I hope that you would subscribe to our podcast, that you would um, that you would like us, that you would leave a five-star review for us on iTunes. I think we're over a thousand downloads uh, for um, the, uh, the podcast already, which has been great for only three months of uh, working at it, maybe three and a half months. So thanks for for, for that. Uh, tell your friends uh, about the podcast. Uh, if you like what you're hearing and want to support us, you can do so at the Present Day Saint on Patreon. Uh, you could also support us through the ministry that I work with, Rashio Christie. I'd love to talk to you about how you can support us uh, in the ministry that we're doing and continue uh, to put out podcasts and do other things here in Utah. We've got lots of ideas for the future. Uh, and so if you're interested in supporting us in that way, I'd love to talk to you about how you can do that. Or you can just go on to Patreon and do it and surprise me. That'd be great. But uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, talking to y'all soon with the next couple episodes of The Present Day Saint. We'll be coming out with a lot more here in the next few weeks. So stay tuned and I, uh, I'll talk to y'all soon. This is Aaron Marshall, the President. Present day saying, signing off.